This is the story of a dragon who never thought humans could do it, but they finally defeated him, the world's only red dragon. A lot of soldiers are attacking him, and one of them instructs others to penetrate the firepower on the vital parts of the dragon. There are very powerful people among them. They attack him with the heavy sword, and they attack him, saying this is his punishment, and he wonders why they are punishing him when he never set foot in human territory. In contrast these 1000 years, humans have attacked him again and again at the cost of flesh and blood. However, in the end, humans killed him, and he thinks this is because he got old and doesn't remember the exact details of what happened before his death. In his remaining memory fragments, when he finds a place that he calls home, human beings will appear for no reason, chasing and attacking his own kind, and they kill his friends and his family members. He tries to use his power and fire to attack them, and soon, he remains the only dragon in the world. He had nothing left, and no one could leave him anymore, and the only reason he lived was to take revenge. When the humans attacked him, they said that word, a tooth for tooth, and an eye for an eye, but it has all ended now, and he could finally rest in peace. When he opens his eyes, he finds himself in a human's arms and wonders what he is doing there. He thinks he should quickly leave this place and wonders where his wings are and why his wings have disappeared. He starts crying, wondering why he has become a human, while his father gets anxious to see him crying. He calls his wife and says the boy seems to like his father, while the dragon asks him to let him go. He gets angry and thinks this man seeking his death, so he will fulfill his wish and will burn him into ashes. His father calls her wife and asks what is wrong with the baby while he spits on his face, trying to use his breath, but his fire turns into spit. He wonders what is happening to his magic while his father is shocked at his action. After that, he gets scared when his mother approaches and wonders what she is going to do with him. She holds him, welcomes him to their family, and calls him Lei, and he wonders if this is a laughable name. He releases his energy and thinks they don't know who he really is. He believes God has reborn him again and he can accomplish his revenge wish. Just like how humans treated him, he will use the human body and will use the words, a tooth for a tooth and an eye for an eye. He is determined to kill all humans and starts laughing and thinking, while his parents think their son is so cheeky. He has a hunch that this little boy is going to be a troublemaker in the future. He thinks he will kill them in the future too, and is shocked at why he suddenly feels so sleepy, and thinks he spends all his energy just to control his mouth. It has been a while since he became a human, and has gained a new understanding of human beings and even knows his parents' names now. Just calling them long-haired and short-haired is too generic, and their names are Jack and Scarlet. Compared to other human beings, they seem to be better looking, Scarlet's soft face always makes her look amiable. This man Jack has larger muscles and is way stronger than other humans. The surrounding villagers often visit them, and they show great respect. One day, two villagers come to see them, and one of them thanks Jack and says if it weren't for his superb swordsmanship, his family might have died in the Black Forest. He can't find a magician a hundred miles around there, and they call them a match made in heaven. And Scarlet says what is important is that everyone is safe and sound. Meanwhile, Lei approaches them, and his mother asks him if he is hungry, and if she will make food for him. She tells Jack that his son is smart because he comes and asks for food when hungry. The villager is surprised to see his hair that they are little red, and his father says his son started to grow red hair a few days ago. Lei thinks red hair means he still has some dragon power left, and the villagers say goodbye to their parents and leave. While going, they believe the Talon family is cursed and normal people can't become adventurers and will encounter unknown dangers anytime. Lei thinks these humans seem to be scared of his red hair and wonders if they feel threatened by him. After some time, his mother brings food for him, and he thinks he doesn't understand these two humans. No matter what he does, they won't get mad, so he tests their boundaries repeatedly and does many bad things in front of them. But every time, they show him their tireless smiling faces. With time, he seems to like his parents and thinks that if there's hell, it's not that bad. In this world, adventurers are rare, and his mother is an even rarer magician. If he were to grasp the world's strongest magic in the future, then his revenge would be easier than he expected. It states that every kid, when they become two years old, has a chance to participate in a magician exam, and today is the day to test if he has a magic power. His father wishes him good luck, and he has to go with his mother. He, the red dragon, who is reincarnated and has a magician's bloodline, is sure that he can definitely pass the test. 
he just needs to get back his magic spell and no one can stop him from returning to the pinnacle. After some time, they reach the town and Lei is only worried about one thing, which is his body which is too weak. He listens to the conversation of the people where the sellers are trying to sell their things to the adventurers. One of the salesmen kicks a beggar away and asks him not to get in the way of his business. Lei is so sad to see them, even though those guys are humans, but he despises and laughs at those who are weaker than themselves. He remembers his past life when he used to take protecting the weak as his duty, and he worked very hard for that but failed in the end. After some time, they reach Roland Academy, where there is a large crowd of people, and a guard is asking people not to squeeze and they will be called if their names are on the list. Lei is also surprised to see so many people and shocked to see a girl running while crying because she has failed. Meanwhile, the guard calls his name and asks them to come forward. A magician is inside, and he asks them to take a seat. He asks his mother to help his son put both of his hands on the crystal ball, and if he has magic talent, the crystal ball will shine. Moreover, the light color will show what element he specializes in, and he happily turns toward the magic ball, thinking the honorable red dragon will shock them all. He thinks there is no magic in the world which he is not specialized in. But he is surprised to see his mother crying, and he wonders why she is not shocked after seeing his magic talent. She thinks this may be because he awakened the same magic type as her, so she cried because of joy, but the question is why the crystal ball is not shining. The old man states that her child doesn't have magic talent, while he is shocked because he was the strongest red dragon in his past life. His mother asks the old man if something is wrong because she has graduated from this academy and become a magician, yet her child doesn't have this talent. The old man apologizes to her and says there is nothing he can do, while Lei thinks he must be joking because he is the one who dominates magic. He rushes toward the old man to punch him, but his mother asks him to stop, and he thinks that the stupid old man is lying. He jumps on the shoulders of the old man and pulls out his mustache while his mother is trying to grab him. He thinks this must be a joke that the great legendary red dragon can't use magic after reincarnation and then thinks God purposely punished him because he has killed too many people. But there's no meaning in this because if God really wanted to punish him, he shouldn't have let him reincarnate. However, he understands that God must give a test and if he can't become a magician, he must seek other ways to take revenge. One day, he is having lunch with his family when he calls his father and asks him to teach him how to fight. His father is happy to learn that his son wants to learn swordsmanship from him. He thinks even though he doesn't have magic, but he can still become a swordsman, and his revenge dream can still be fulfilled. It is said that revenge won't be as easy as someone imagines, and he has learned swordsmanship from him for two years, but he hasn't even won once. His father comes toward to attack, and he thinks of changing his luck today. He attacks him with a familiar move, and he thinks he needs to wait for the accurate timing spin sideways the moment the sword falls, and he will be able to hit his flank. But he was shocked when his father changed his attack pattern at the last moment, and he lost again. He wonders why this always happens to him. The human body can't keep up with his brain, and his clumsy hands always drag him down. He gets hit on his head and gets unconscious, and his father laughs at him. His mother gets angry with him, asks how he can laugh, and asks him to go easy on him because he is just four years old. He replies that there is only a year left for the night exam, and if this goes on, he probably will fail. She gets angry and says that is too much for Lei, and he doesn't have to follow in their footsteps, and other than being an adventurer, there are many nobles' jobs in this world. His father asks her not to worry and says it's not too much for him. He says it's happening because he is too young to control his body properly. He thinks he needs to participate in Aviorn Knight Academy's night exam with those human kids next year and there's only one year left. He wonders if he will make it in time. He calls his parents, asks them not to worry about him, and promises them that he will become the strongest human everyone has ever seen. He then starts practicing and thinks his physical fitness should have far surpassed that of humans of the same age, but his body is clumsy. Meanwhile, his father comes to him and says he knew he would be there, and he gives him a sword, saying this sword will be his now, and with his strength, he can use a real sword for training. The sword will help him to grasp control of his body faster, and he whispers in his ear that he has another present for him. He takes him inside the warehouse, shows him a magic wooden puppet, and tells him that the Averin Knight Academy used it to train newbies. 
He doesn't seem impressed by it and says it's just a wooden puppet, and his father asks him to try attacking it. He tries to attack him, and the level 1 puppet activates with this and dodges his attack. He is shocked at his reaction, and the puppet counterattacks him and throws his sword at a distance. The level 1 stopped, and his father asked him if he liked the puppet. He says if he can defeat the level 1 wooden puppet, he assures that he can be admitted into the Knight Academy, and he obtained this through using connections. He gets happy and thinks no matter how long it will take, he will make sure to overcome it. A whole year has passed, but his movement can't keep up at all with his body because this body is really too weak. According to the Adapt Speed, he forgets about his revenge, and now he doesn't even know when he can defeat the wooden puppet. Meanwhile, someone appears from behind and asks why he wants to defeat the wooden puppet. He gets up shockingly and asks who is there, and is surprised to see a little girl there, and she asks him if he is alright. She introduces herself as Amy, and she lives in this village. She saw that she was alone there at such a late hour, so she wanted to remind him to go down the mountain early. Lei asks her if this plane is dangerous, and she replies that it's not dangerous in the morning, but this place is near the forest, so there will be beasts roaming when it's night. Lei is impressed by her knowledge and says she learns quite a lot. She replies that she often picks fruits and wild vegetables nearby, so she is familiar with this place. It's about to get dark soon, so she asks him to go down the mountain together, and he is about to tell her his name when she calls him by the name Lei and says she already knows him. She exclaims that he is famous in the village, and he thinks he is famous in the village. People are surprised to see his red hair whenever he walks through the streets. In this village, no human being has ever had red hair, and he is an outlier with red haired. Even though people in the village respect his parent, they fear him for no reason. He doesn't know if it's because adults always use vicious red dragons to scare human cubs, and red in human society often represents evil and strength. It's ironic because it's obvious that the greedy human beings wiped out their dragon race, yet, in the story, the dragon race is described as a synonym for evil. However, their acts of revenge and even self-protection have become evidence of the cruel violence of the dragon race in the mouth of humans. Amy interrupts him and asks what he is thinking about, and he starts following her down the mountains. She asks him if he practices swordsmanship because whenever she comes there, she sees him there. He replies that he wants to become a swordsman, and she also agrees with him, saying his father is the only swordsman in this village. Her big brother also plans to apply to the academy, and she exclaims that no one in the village can defeat him, but he envies Lei because his father can teach him. She asks him to be friends with his brother to practice swordsmanship together. In the meantime, three boys come near them, and one of them asks him not to get near his little sister. Amy interrupts them and says he did nothing to her, and her brother asks why she is with that red-haired and asks her to remember that he is cursed. He checks her hair to see if it has turned red, and other boys come to lay and ask how he dares to walk with Amy. They bully him saying his parents must have a hard time while giving birth to a kid like him who is cursed, and what scary thing they provoke to be entangled by this curse. They tell her many more things and ask him to leave the village with his family, he is just bearing them with patience. Suddenly, he calls one of them and punches his face, but Amy's brother tries to save him. Lei pushes him away and asks him not to get his way because he only wants to beat the one who ridiculed his parents. Ame's brother smiles and says he knows that his parents are adventurers, his father is a swordsman, and he should have gotten his training. If he is willing to fight, then he will fight him. He will not use his weapon because he doesn't want to kill him, while Amy tries to stop him, but no one listens to her. Lei also drops his sword, says he doesn't wish to kill him either, and says he won't mind if they attack him together. Soon, Grey and Lei start fighting while his friends cheer for him, and Grey defeats him and asks him to admit his defeat. He badly falls to the ground and also steals his money. He exclaims that with his standard, he is still far from being an adventurer, and he always thought he had his father's help in training, but he is still useless. He asks him to give up on becoming a swordsman and do something else he is good at. He gets unconscious, and when they reach their home, Amy says he went overboard today, and he replies that Lei was asking for it. He forbids her not to go near him and not to get influenced by him, and he is different from them, and their parents are all normal people. Amy gets angry and leaves the room, and Grey is shocked to see his damaged armor. He thinks that if he didn't have this armor, his arm would have broken on his first attack and lay one that match. 
The next morning, Lei is going toward the mountain for practice when he sees Amy on his way. She wishes him good morning, and he asks her if she is waiting for him. She replies that she wants to apologize to him for what happened yesterday. He asks her not to say sorry because it wasn't her fault and he wasn't good enough. She gets sad about this and Lei thinks humans really are troublesome, and he thinks he has to deal with humans' so-called social norms. He picks an apple from her basket and says he has accepted his apology. He thinks humans truly are sensitive and they can cry and laugh at the drop of a hat. At the same time, at the house of Talens, Lei's parents are informed that villagers near the border were all attacked by something. There are no near eyewitness reports yet, but someone has already been infected. Most of them are still delirious and unable to recount what has happened, so they have come for his help. His mother also wants to join them, saying things usually wouldn't approach the areas where humans gather, which is abnormal. His father asks her not to worry because it's just an investigative mission, and besides, Lei will soon take the test, and one of them should stay behind to take care of him. He promises her to return soon, and she asks him to be careful. On the other hand, Lei gets tired and thinks he still can't do it and can't get used to human body coordination. Suddenly, he observes that Amy is still there and is busy studying. He likes her sitting there and stars staring at her unconsciously. But soon, he wakes himself and thinks this human body must have affected him. He asks her to stop there and return to their homes, and she agrees that it's already too late. They are walking on a bridge when she runs from behind and asks him to wait for a while. She then checks her surroundings, says it's safe, and tells him that she needs to ensure Grey won't hurt him again. Lei is surprised that a human girl is protecting him and asks her if she is not worried about how others will view her. She replies that what people think is their own business and she has her own opinions and she won't believe those ridiculous rumors. She also asks him not to care about what other people say because he has his own path to take. He remembers when Grey told him to do something more suited to his level, and he thanks Ame for her advice. He happily runs toward his home, asking her to see her tomorrow. This time, he goes to the warehouse and activates level one of the wooden puppet. He turns into the dragon's form, holds the sword in his mouth, and jumps upon the puppet to attack. This time, he successfully dodges his attacks, and the puppet reveals that he has cleared his level 1. He is so happy that he passed the first level, he remembers what his father said that he can pass the Knight Academy's test as long as he defeats a level 1 magic dummy, and now he wants to test his military. Suddenly, the wooden puppet activates level 2, and he has to fight it to check his limits. The next morning, when he wakes up, he sees his father ready for somewhere, and asks him where he is going when the sun has just risen. He tells him that he has received a new mission and won't be home for a while, but he promises to return by the time he takes the examination. He instructs him to train hard with the wooden dummy while he is gone, and he is sure he will defeat it. He is about to tell him that he has already passed level 1, but someone calls his father from outside and asks if he is ready to set off. His father turns toward his mother and asks her to look after herself and lay. He leaves the house, and Lei thinks it's all right and clearing the dummy's trail is nothing much, and when he returns, he will definitely shock him. He wonders how excitedly silly dad will get, and seeing his reaction will be fun. If it weren't for Amy's hint, he wouldn't have figured out a way. He now knows how it feels to anticipate something, and how it feels to feel grateful towards someone emotionally, and he seems to be becoming more and more like a human. He thinks humans may be annoying. But these three are excluded, his father, mother, and Ame. He thinks he will not exact his revenge on them. After some time, he unconsciously waits for Ame, who hasn't arrived yet, but suddenly, he is shocked at why he is so excitedly waiting for her arrival. He then laughs and says no one will disturb his training now, and thinks he should hurry and start training. He must never let himself be corrupted by human emotions again, because he is the Great Red Dragon. After much training, he gets tired and lays on the ground. Suddenly, he gets up quickly because it's already so late, and he will get nagged if he doesn't go home now. He then heads toward home, thinking he will thank Ame tomorrow for her help. Suddenly, he sees a group of people, and they are probably looking for something. Grey and Ame's parents are looking for Grey and ask an old man if he has seen him. The old man replies that there were a total of four of them, and they came to his shop early this morning to buy new weapons, and he heard the blonde boy tell the rest that he wanted to enter the forest or something to hunt the demonic beast. 
a woman shouts at the old man and asks him why he didn't stop them because they are just children. The old man asks her to calm down because he didn't know they would actually follow through with their plans. Gray's father says that the forest is too dangerous at night and asks others to inform the guards and they will get them to search together with them. Lay passes through them and learns that Gray and his group have gone missing and thinks karma came so fast and is really reaping what he sowed. He thinks he can save the effort of killing them with his own hands if they die to demonic beasts. But he realizes the Ame also went missing and thinks she treated him well and he didn't plan to exact revenge on her but unfortunately, she has a foolish brother. He thinks humans have always had a short lifespan, and dying early and dying last is all the same. However, he remembers when he first met her and when she told him he had his path to take. He wonders about the stuffy feeling in his chest and thinks Ame is innocent and shouldn't deserve this kind of fate. Moreover, he still hasn't told her that she is the one who helped him defeat the wooden dummy and runs toward the forest to save her. Conversely, Grey has defeated two monsters in the forest, while Ame seems so scared. He asks her not to move because a large monster is in front of them, and they haven't the power to defeat him. Meanwhile, Lei is running towards the forest and smells blood from a distance, but gets relieved to see an adolescent demon wolf's body. There's a slash on its belly that was caused by a knife, and the corpse is still warm. He assumes that they must be near, but the footsteps and tracks there are too messy, and he wonders which direction he should go. Suddenly, he hears Ame's voice from a side and runs toward that side. The monster hits Grey and becomes unconscious while Ame is calling him and asks him to wake up. The monster roars again and jumps toward her to attack, and she is so scared and calls someone to save them. In the meantime, Lei reaches there and puts his sword in the monster's mouth. He asks Ame if she is fine, and she tells him about Grey and others who have passed out. Suddenly, the monster again rushes toward them to attack, and Lei gets hurt on his arm. Ame asks him to watch out, and he says she doesn't need to worry because he will not die yet. He thinks he needs to lure the demon wolf away from Ame and jumps on a tree to distract him. The wolf rushes toward him and simultaneously jumps on another tree, resulting in the demon wolf getting stuck in the branch of a tree. However, his human body is too weak and there's absolutely no way for him to fight evenly with an adult demon wolf. His speed is ridiculously pathetic in the face of absolute strength and he cannot lure it away. In his past life, demon wolves were nothing to him, but now they even can't attack him. He thinks these humans belong to him and the demon wolf can't dare to touch them. The wolf roars again and is coming toward them again to attack, but he can't last much longer and thinks he must make this attack count. He tries to target the weakest point of the demon wolf and jumps upon him to attack his eye. He then falls to the ground, his claws are too weak only to manage to destroy an eye. He thinks if this had happened in the past instead, then just a single swipe would have been enough for him to sink his claws into its brain, and he thinks he needs to make better use of human weapons. The demon wolf again rushes toward him, and Lei finds out that there is a flaw in its defense, and they will see which is tougher among them. He shields his sword and cuts one of the demon wolf's legs. The demon wolf cries in pain and falls to the ground while Amy cries in full loudly. He then again rushes toward the demon wolf to attack, taking the sword in his mouth and using his full power to attack him this time. The demon wolf gets defeated and falls to the ground, and he finally gets rid of it. He then turns toward Amy and Grey, who is unconscious, and he is also about to be unconscious when he sees a yellow flame light in the air. A status window appears in front of him, showing he has obtained some reward and asks his permission if he wants to absorb them or not. He wonders what this useless data is and ignores it. He gets up and thinks his priority right now is to save them because the blood will attract more demon beasts. He lifts Grey on his shoulders and is surprised to see him there while he asks him not to move around. He is at his limit carrying the two of them and gets tired of seeing two more there and wonders how he will take them all. He tried his best, but he had to leave their survival on their fate and leave them there. On the other side, the villagers also look for them and ask each other if they have discovered anything. Meanwhile, they see Lei carrying Grey and Amy on his shoulders. They recognize him as the red-headed kid from the Talon family, and he becomes unconscious when reaching them. They are shocked to see that he left the forest on his own feet while carrying two other kids. Meanwhile, a woman rushes toward them and asks about his sons Bob and Kyle, who are not among them, 
and Gray's father tells her that Lei has only brought these two kids out. She tries to enter the forest, but they stop her and ask her to calm down. She runs toward the forest, saying she will find out her children by herself. She rushes toward the forest, but gets scared to see a lot of demon beasts there and returns back toward the village. The villagers wonder why she is back, and she shouts at them, saying she is not definitely scared. She grabs Lei from his collar, asks about her sons, and exclaims that they are both obedient kids and would never enter the forest. She slaps him and asks if he tricked her kids into the forest, and she already said long ago that red hair was ominous. Everyone blames him and asks why he tricked the kids and asks about them. She beats him and asks why he only brought Amy and Gray back and where Bob and Kyle are. He gets severely injured and just utters that they are in the forest, and she angrily asks him why he left them alone when they are just kids. He wonders if they have forgotten that he is also a child and thinks all of them are cold-blooded monsters. The villagers ask the woman if she really plans to enter the forest in search of them, and they refuse to help her saying their kids are waiting for them. Lei wonders if they have been so blinded by his red hair that they have forgotten that he is human too, and they don't consider him a child and they only see him as a monster. The woman grabs the lantern and says she will find her children on her own, and she turns toward Lei, saying she will never forgive him. She tries to burn him with the fire calling him a red-haired monster, and Lei wonders if he is going to die again without taking his revenge. He closes his eyes to accept his fate when Grey interrupts her and blocks her attack. The people exclaim that the red-haired boy is a real monster, and he has bewitched Grey. Grey asks them if they have lost their mind and asks them how they can decide on someone's death based on mere guesses, and asks them not to dare to touch his savior. He remembers when the woman tried to attack him, saying he should die because he was just a precursor of disaster, and he remembers his past life when humans tried to kill him, saying the red dragon is a disaster. Suddenly, he wakes up on his bed and finds out that it was all a dream. His mother is sleeping on the ground near him, and he observes that she is crying over her child. He wonders how human hearts are just as beautiful as they are cruel. He wakes his mother up, and she gets happy to see him and asks if she is really dreaming. She hugs him, saying she thought he would never wake up again. She hopes she has learned his lesson and instructs him never to act so rashly in the future again. He asks her how long he has been sleeping, and she tells him that he slept for a whole week and she wouldn't have known what to tell his dad if he didn't wake up. He asks about the condition of the other children, and she reveals that the two children he saved were only lightly injured, but Bob and Kyle still haven't been found. She is afraid they might have already died. One week ago when she reached there, Gray tried to save him and told them Lei was his savior. His mother is shocked to see his condition and angrily asks them who did this to her son. The villagers ask her to calm down and say her child egged them on to enter the woods and is responsible for this. One of them said she was also a mother, so she can understand how it feels to have their child go missing. She came forward and saved Lei from them, while the woman started crying and asked who would save her children. The villagers sympathize with her and exclaim she will never be able to lead a normal life after this and everything happens because of Lei's curse. She left the forest with Lei while the people whispered and made fun of her and her family. At present, she tells him that everything is over now and it's not his fault so he should not blame himself. Moreover, Grey already told her what happened there so she praises him for his bravery. She then leaves the room, saying she will make something for him while he stays quiet. After some time, the yellow status window appeared again, and he thought he had already noticed this thing. He wonders if everyone has it and touches the dragon eyes. Suddenly, the dragon's eye activates, and he can see through the wall with this help. He remembers that these skills are from his past life. He remembers when he was still a giant red dragon and knew countless spells. After failing the Magic Academy entrance test, he thought he would never have a chance to use it again, but it has come back. He is happy, thinking he will have to regain his skills individually. He observes that he has obtained this skill after killing that intermediate demon wolf. Suddenly, he felt some smoke coming from outside and was shocked to see that their house was on fire. His mother rushes toward the room and tells him they must escape the village. She uses her magic and asks him to watch out, while Lei uses his dragon eye and discovers that the target is carrying flammable items at threat level. Bob and Kylie's mother is the real culprit who has put their house on fire. Meanwhile, the villagers are sure that the red-headed kid is the one who brought this disaster upon them. 
Lei's mother is trying to extinguish the fire using her magic and uses her skills of dispersal to stop it. Soon, she has extinguished the fire, while the villagers comment this is due to the curse and if he continues staying there, this village will be destroyed sooner or later. His mother calls him and asks if the fire scared him, but she gets worried when he doesn't respond to him. She calls him again, and he laughs and says she is amazing because the fire disappeared in the blink of an eye. However, he is sad thinking that the humans want to burn their houses down, and they may even wish for them to perish in the fire and want them dead. He is more determined to get his revenge now. The next morning, he tells his mother that he is going to train, and she advises him not to push himself too hard because his injuries haven't recovered yet. He then reaches outside the forest and uses his dragon's eye to check the demon beasts. It looks like the demon beasts in the vicinity are all basic tier, and this should not take too much effort. After some time, a demon monkey eats an apple on a tree when he appears from behind and stabs his sword at him. Soon, he got 20 of them and thought this should be enough for today, and a status window appeared there saying he had obtained a basic tier demon beast crystal absorb. He thinks this thing looks like a drop by chance because he killed 20 basic tier demonic beasts, but he only got two crystals and wonders what the effect of absorbing them is. Suddenly, he observes a baby wolf is still alive, and he goes to him, saying he has to fight on his own from now on. A status window shows he has gotten the opportunity to take the black demon wolf cub. He doesn't know what that thing is, but he presses the button on yes and decides to try it. Soon, he is happy to see that he succeeded because the black demon wolf cub has been tamed, but he is later shocked to see it enter his body after getting tamed. He wonders if there will be any side effects and if he can summon him. He receives a system notice that he has received a reward and unlocked a skill named Beast Taming and he guesses that he somehow managed to get his hands on a new skill. However, this isn't the time to study it, and he needs to finish his important tasks first, and he observes Bob and Kylie's presence. He uses the dragon's eye and finds them behind a mountain. He goes inside the cave and is surprised to see their dead bodies there. He removes their clothes and puts them in his bucket. After some time, he leaves the cave and reaches his home. His mother worries about him and asks him not to push himself, but he ignores her, saying he still needs to train, so he wants to sleep. She tells him that his father should be back after a few days, and he can ask him to accompany him for training when he returns. Lei is happy to hear that, and is eager to show his father his training results. He kicks his quilt excitedly. His mother gets angry and shouts at him to put the quilt in its place. The same night he was sleeping in his room, he woke up suddenly and went to the warehouse. He picks up the bucket where he puts Bob and Kylie's clothes and goes to their house. He knocks at the door and their mother comes downstairs and asks who is at the door at this hour. She thinks it can be Bob and Kyle who have returned for their mother and happily opens the door, hoping for them outside. She is shocked to see Kyle's shirt outside and grabs it immediately. She then sees some footsteps with the shirt and thinks Kyle is calling his mother. She followed the footsteps, ran toward that side and soon reached the forest entrance. That place is too dark and she thinks she shouldn't continue and gets scared of going further. When he tries to return, she is shocked to see Bob's shirt with a tree branch. She runs toward the shirt while Lei is watching her movement from a branch of a tree. He has a bucket full of blood and as soon as she reaches under the tree, he drops the basket on her. The woman is covered with blood and starts crying out of fear and calls someone for help. In the meantime, Lei jumps in front of her, and she exclaims that she knew he was behind all this. She calls him a monster that has reincarnated and asks him to return his kids. Suddenly, there are a large number of monsters, and she gets so scared to see them. She shouts for help, but no one is there, and soon the monster kills him in front of him while he just stares at her. The next morning, villagers are talking about the woman and think the curse is indeed true, and they decide not to provoke the Talon family in the future. This time, their attitude has changed with Lei, and they ask him about his health and call him so hard working that he went to train again. He passes by them, thinking it seems like there are new rumors, but he likes them this time. He then comes to his home and is shocked to see many horses outside. He happily opens the door, asking if his dad has come back, but he is shocked to see his mother crying. He rushes toward her and asks what happened to him, and she tells him that his father is sick. She asks him to stay strong and he will get better. He uses his dragon's eye skill to check his disease and thinks he has never even seen someone in this state before, even when he was the red dragon. 
A guard tells them that he has contracted the Plague of Shadow. When they were at the border, he was attacked by a shadow beast in order to protect a villager. While Lei thinks he has never seen this thing before in his past life, neither Shadow nor Plague of Shadow. He wonders when this kind of monster appeared in the world and what happened to the world when he died. His mother thanked the guard for taking her husband back, and they apologized for being unable to protect him. Lei sees his status window and thinks his spell may help him. He decides to use one of the high-rank magic spells that he has mastered, able to dispel all black magic and curses. However, he doesn't know how to unlock that ability, and if he needs to kill beasts to obtain rewards, then he must be able to kill a high-rank beast to get the high-rank magic spell. However, his current state is too weak that he can't defeat a high-rank demon. He asks his mother if he enrolls in Avrian Academy, then he will be stronger, and she is shocked at his question in this kind of situation. She smiles and says he will be stronger indeed because that's the place where his father learned, and he will definitely be as strong as him. He promises her mother that he will definitely enroll in Avrian Academy and find a way to cure his father. She hugs him and says she trusts him and that he will find a way. On the other side, there are a lot of priests in a church, and one of them exosiums that the prophecy has been revealed and the world is about to change dramatically. They wonder what the red hair boy will bring, redemption or disaster. Everything is unknown yet, and the Great Elder orders them to inform the Knight's Hall to find him quickly. If he is doing it for redemption, then they will guide him, but if he is a disaster, then they will eliminate him. After some time, it's the annual night exam day and the people have been queuing there before going down to get the best positions. They are happy to see the knights and after some time they arrive. They are excited to see the knight Delbert there and exclaim he really lives up to his reputation. He is so handsome that the girls are falling for him and it's just the annual night exam day. They can see the demeanor of the knights. After that, they gathered outside the palace and the knight from the Avrian Academy of Winford introduced him. The person standing beside him is Knight Delbert and the Knight Bernardo whom they are most familiar. Today, the three of them will jointly conduct the entrance exam for children who have reached the age of five. He calls people and asks if they are interested in joining the Avrian Knight Academy, they have to demonstrate their combat ability. Lei is also among them, and the Knight shows them the sword puppet in its place. He announces to begin the first test officially and asks everyone to enter the stage in order. The first child goes to the stage and thinks it's just a wooden puppet. Even if he is strong, he can use his strength to defeat him. He is ready to face the puppet while his parents cheer for him and call him the best son. But soon, they are shocked to see that their son failed the challenge and only took one second. The knight calls for the next challenger, and Lei thinks this is just like his dad said. He needs to defeat the level 1 puppet. Even though level 1 wooden puppet won't move, but defense and attack speed are as fast as an adult. Meanwhile, he hears two knights talking to each other, Delbert says coming there was just a waste of time, and the other one says they must perform their duties according to the request of the elders. They are so far away, yet he can still hear what they say, and it seems like he has obtained more monster cores. He has gathered 36 diamond crystals, and as a result, his sense has become sharper. Delbert exclaims that knights should come from noble bloodlines, and he really doesn't see why these filthy civilians are worthy of wasting their time. He sighs and says many rounds have passed, and not even a single one has passed. After some time, Grey has passed the exam, and the knight says he already knows that he's different from other kids. Grey smiles and wishes the best of luck to Lay, and the knights are surprised to see that the kid is red-haired. Everyone shouts for him, saying he is the cursed kid and his hair is red like blood. They say he can never become a knight because he is a monster who can just harm people. Meanwhile, the knight asks the next candidate to prepare and Delbert exclaims that he doesn't believe in prophecies. If that red hair is as prophesied, then he should be able to pass. He intentionally activates level 3 of the wooden puppet and rushes toward Lei while the other knight asks him to watch out. The puppet jumps upon him to attack while one of the knights tries to help him because it can be dangerous for him. But they were shocked to see that he didn't just pass the test, but also cut the puppet's head from its body and passed it. Knight Windforce orders the old knight to announce the result. He congratulates Lei and announces that he has passed the test. Grey and his mother are the ones who are happy with his result. The same day, he tells his father that he has passed the exam and is now leaving the village with the knights. He knows he can't hear him, but he promises he will find a way to cure him. 
Meanwhile, his mother comes to him and asks him to bring their family's heirloom with him, hoping it can bring him good luck. He asks her to take care of herself and she also asks him to take care of himself and she is always with him if he encounters any problems. He then leaves the house while she just prays for his good health. After some time he reaches the other knights and Knight Winford asks him to get on since another lad is waiting for him in the carriage. He is then shocked to see Grey in the other carriage and wonders why only they had just passed. They face off against each other in the carriage and after some time they start their journey. After some time, Grey calls him apologizes to him and says when he defeated him, he said something rude. He bends before him and apologizes, saying he is just an idiot. Lay asks him to forget about it and he is just a five-year-old kid and he also saved him before so that they will count it even. Grey exclaims he is saying as if he isn't five years old and he asks her about Ame and why she didn't come to send him off today. Grey reveals that she went to Roland Academy and he is surprised that Ame never told him she has magic talent. Suddenly, someone blocks their path and asks them to stop. They are shocked to see such heavy smoke in front of them, and Knight Winford tells them that they are Arviron Academy's knight group and asks the person to tell them their name. This is a girl who asks them for help, and she reveals that she is an adventurer from the No Trav Guild and Wardek. The old knight asks her what happened to her group, and she tells him that their team was attacked and it's a nether shadow beats. The old man is surprised to hear about the beast and says they didn't even encounter any beast on their way there. Delbert brags and says beasts might have felt their aura, so they didn't dare to come near. Winford tells her that they are heading to Rainy Town, and if she is also going somewhere near, they can give her a ride. Wardak asks her to drop her at Rainy Town, and Grey asks them if they are not going to the Night Academy. Delbert replies there is no use in sending kids like him to the front line. Knight Winford tells them that since the Alvrian Knight Academy is a fortress located at the border, a war can occur any time. They have to train at Rainy Town for ten years until they grasp basic combat skills. Then they can further develop their skills at Alvrian Knight Academy. Lay is shocked to hear about ten years and thinks to a dragon. Ten years doesn't mean much, but humans don't have a long life. He wonders if his dad can survive this long and if he can find a cure for him. Grey is scared of the beast monster and remembers when the nether shadow beast attacked Lay's father, and he doesn't dare to imagine what will happen if they encounter it on their way. In the meantime, they are faced by a shadow beast, and Knight Winford asks everyone to take note and enter their combat mode. It's a fallen king bear, but it's infected with a nether shadow beast, and they rush toward them to attack while Winford asks everyone to get ready to fight. Suddenly, one of them appears behind the old knight, and he gets scared thinking he can't dodge it. In the meantime, Lay jumps in their way and cuts the bear using his sword. The old knight appreciates both of them and asks them to protect themselves. However, they are surprised to see that the big fellow is not moving yet, and they don't know if it seems to be waiting for something. Suddenly, two bears surround Grey and make him scared, but Lay appears from behind again and attacks them. He then asks Grey to be careful because the fallen bear's power is much stronger than Demon Wolf. In the meantime, the big wolf screams loudly and releases an immense amount of pressure. His power is way too scary, but they wonder what he wants to do because he is only standing there. He then turns toward them and says forever can't defeat darkness, and darkness will eventually take over this continent. They are shocked to see that it talked, and the bear comes toward them, saying they are destined to fall, and those beside them will all die. Delbert wonders what his words mean, and the old knight says he said those to threaten them, Suddenly, the bear jumps and leaves the place, and Winford says they are lucky that he didn't choose to fight them. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to leave unscathed. Lay receives a notification that he obtained novice rank beast core while he observes the wolf saying those words to him. Knight Winford comes to them and says they performed very well and assures them that they will become qualified knights. Lay asks him if they have ever encountered beasts that speak, and he states that they don't often encounter better shadow beasts in the frontier, and it's his first time encountering one that speaks. He wonders why this kid is so calm and he has performed beyond his age, while Delbert is just staring at him angrily and thinks he just hates them. The next morning, they reach Rainy Town, and there seem to be more guards than usual. Winford asks the knights about the security, and he reveals that the Kingdom of Allure has issued an Amber Alert, and all towns have been put under martial law. He observes that the situation is serious, and this continent is already in jeopardy. 
He wonders if Lei will be chosen to bring redemption to the people who just want to become a knight. He thinks his dad needs to wait for him so that he can find a cure for him. Ten years later in Rainy Town, the teacher asks the class about the one type of ability that knights can't use. Gray raises his hand and tells her that the ability's name is Kai and that cultivating Kai can strengthen the body and make its senses more sensitive. It can even break through the limit of human beings in a short period of time. The teacher is impressed by him and says it seems like they have made their preparations and she asks the students if they can tell why it is necessary to cultivate Kai after 15 years old. She calls Lei, but Gray is also shocked at where he disappeared. He makes an excuse that he went to the bathroom, and she calls another student Naslavia to tell her. She gets up and states that cultivating Kai will bring a huge burden to the body, and after 15 years old, the development of internal organs becomes natural. Only when they start to cultivate at this time will they not cause more damage to their body. The teacher praises her and says just as she has said, they will officially embark on the path of cultivation. She hopes that they can keep the knowledge they have learned in their mind and it will be useful to them when they put it into practice in the future. On the other side, Lei is in the forest and commands a wolf named Nova to attack another beast and it defeats the other beast in just one attack. He receives a notification that he has obtained Novice Rank Beast Core. Soon, the Novice Rank Beast's core energy completely absorbed him. He then asks his pet wolf to end this at the moment because if he goes back any later, someone will probably go crazy again. In the meantime, Knight Winford appears there and says this is totally unexpected because he was thinking about who he would meet first when he came back. He says there's no doubt that he can slip away in such tight security and they have met after 10 years. Lay explains he is still the same and he doesn't even see a single wrinkle on his face after 10 years and he doesn't really know how old he is. Winford laughs and says it's a secret, and he heard from his personal tutor that he recently often sneaks out to hunt beasts. Lay exclaims if Amber Alert hasn't been Liffin recently, it would be hard for him to sneak out, but compared to sitting in the classroom, he prefers to hunt beasts outside. Winford says he should be happy that he didn't go far because they wouldn't be polite if the outer cordon guards found him. He then tells him that he went to his house and told him that his father's illness didn't become worse and his mother took care of him well and asked him to convey it to him. He thanks Winford for his concern and thinks in the past ten years, whether it's windy or raining outside, he practiced hard, but still, he didn't awaken any new skill. Everything is still as clueless as it was at the beginning. Winford calls him and says they will go to the town together, and tomorrow will be the day they go to the Avrian Academy, and he can't wait to go meet the other little ones. On the other side, at the rainy town entrance, two guards are fighting over him, and one of them says Ambert Alert got removed, so they have no reason to stop him. The other one shouts at him and says he is special, and they must take note of his every moment. In the meantime, Lay enters with Winford, and he calls the knight named Aaron and says it's nice to meet him. He shouts at Lay and asks where he went, and he tells him many times not to leave his sight, but he even skips class and runs outside. He hides behind Winford and says it has been one month since Amber Alert was removed, so it is normal for him to go outside. He exclaims that he is leaving soon and Aaron will completely be at ease after that. Winford interrupts them and asks both of them to take one step back. Soon, an announcement asks all students to gather at the plaza quickly. Gray asks Lay if he got caught because he came back so quickly, and he replies that he was just unlucky this time. The attendant Lancy introduces himself and says from tomorrow onwards, he will lead them to Avrian Knight Academy. The journey will be around seven days, and if they don't want any accidents, they must obey his orders throughout the journey. A knight asks Winford if he decided on the route this time, and he replies that they are taking the swamp route. The knights are surprised to hear this and ask if it isn't too early for those kids and Winford says if they want to become knights, then they need to pass some tests. Furthermore, this time, there are other students with them with the same muscular abilities. The next day, at the rainy town entrance, all the students set off on the journey to the Ravelin Academy. One of them asked why they didn't use the teleport device and if they couldn't directly reach the destination with a teleport device. If they use teleport, they could obviously save a lot of distance, and one of them replies it's because there is no teleport device in Avrian Knight Academy. Naslavia exclaims it seems like they didn't pay attention in classes and says Aviron Academy is on the border. Not only do they need to resist the invasion of foreign enemies, but also need to fight against Nether Shadow Beast. 
If they set up the teleport device there, the enemies can instantly teleport to any part of their country once the academy is defeated. The students are shocked to hear that and wonder if the teacher said it before, and Gray wonders if she was looking there just now or if he saw it wrongly. In the evening, they stop near the castle ruin, and the knights ask them to prepare for camping. While making camps, Gray tells Lei that Neslavia is looking at him, and he asks him if there is anything to see about him. They turn their faces together, and Neslavia immediately turns her face to the other side. Lei thinks this is because of his red hair, while she says he is not the only one with red hair anymore. Four more students with red hair are among them, Huang, Duo, Kyle, and Ian, respectively. They are all building tents, and Kyle exclaims he is faster than anyone in the group. Lei observes them and says Gray is right, but it doesn't matter if she looks at him or not. At the same time, two students sneak out toward the back of the castle ruin, and they feel a very bad smell from there. The smell is so bad that even dead rats don't stink like this, and there's no end to this sticky mess. One of them exclaims it seems like a swamp when suddenly a knight appears behind them and says it's a swamp and threatens them, asking if they don't want to have their legs bitten off by sharp insects in the swamp because they doze off. He suggests they quickly go and build their tent and sleep. At night, one of the knights is guarding them while Lei takes advantage of dinner time to foe some research, slipping out from there is easy, and he doesn't even have to avoid the guarding knight. But he gets shocked when Naslavi holds his hand and says it's so late now and asks him where he is going, and he replies that he is going to hunt beasts. She asks him if he is crazy and says this isn't near Rainy Town and asks him what happens when he encounters an intermediate rank beast, then the knights won't be able to save him in time. But he doesn't listen to him and says he can deal with intermediate rank beasts too, and she doesn't need to worry about him. The next morning, Gray wakes up on the call of a knight, and he says last to wake up will receive punishment, and he gets scared to see Lay's eyes. He asks him what happened to him and asks if he didn't have a nice sleep last night, but he says he slept well. He asks him to quickly wake up because he doesn't wish to be punished in front of so many people. Meanwhile, he is watching his status window and thinks according to this speed before he reaches Avrian Academy, he can absorb novice rank beast core to maximum level. Now he can start absorbing intermediate rank core soon. After some time, they continue their journey, and Gray observes that there is too quiet outside, while Lei is sleeping carelessly. Suddenly, he wakes up by a horse's voice, and a monster enters their carriage and scares the students. They take out their sword, and Gray reveals that it's a sharp bug and asks everyone to get ready to battle. The bug is about to attack a girl when Gray interrupts, cuts his arm, and asks everyone to watch out and protect themselves. They are scared to see so much blood, and Gray reveals that sharp bugs appear in the group and more and more of them will appear, and he asks everyone to watch out. He asks everyone to group in three persons and not leave any dead corners for defense. Everyone excitedly rushes out of the carriage, saying they will see who kills more bugs, while Lei wonders why they are so excited. He activates Dragon Eye Mode and finds out there are too many of them. They are just novice rank beast, and Lei thinks there's nothing to worry about, and he finds out that the six knights left beforehand. He understands the situation and goes back to the carriage, while one of them asks what he is doing, and asks him not to destroy the formation. He exclaims that it's just novice rank beasts, they don't need his help, and they have the exact number of people. Meanwhile, the knights are surprised to see his behavior and wonder if he is just scared, and it seems he can only get a red belt. They are impressed by Gray's behavior because he is performing very well and doesn't hesitate to kill them with one attack. His movements are small, and he can see Sly controls his body to rescue unnecessary consumption, and one of the knights says he should be able to get a white belt. Winford is impressed by Naslavia's attacks, and although she rarely takes the initiative to attack, but she has extraordinary insight, and her posture of holding a sword is very standard. In the meantime, a bug tries to attack her but she counterattacks it and cuts it with her sword, and Winford is impressed by her movements. Suddenly, they are surprised to see an explosion there, and they are also shocked to see that the sharp bugs have gathered together and become a big fellow. The students get scared to see them, and they are about to attack one student when one of the red-headed students attacks them and cuts many of the bugs saying no one can harm his companions. Duo and his brother are also fighting bravely, while Kyle enjoys their encounters. The knight says it seems like they don't have to do anything, and these red-haired kids are indeed not bad except one. 
The fight is almost over, and the students also seem tired Ian asks others if they are alright. Winford thinks Ian is strong and knows how to take care of teammates. After that, Gray asks Lay why he didn't join them, and says the carriage is dangerous, and if anything happened, then they couldn't have saved him in time. Lay replies that he is too sleepy and knights are watching, so there won't be a problem. Kyle brags and says he has killed most bugs, and it seems like beasts are nothing much against him. He feels like they can become real knights very soon. One of them brags and says if he gets lucky, he might get a white belt, and Gray asks him what the white belt is. He replies that even though they will become knights, but knights have ranks too, and those knights following them are all white ribbon squires, the highest rank. Whoever gets a white belt means knights in the exam acknowledge their skills. It is revealed that other than white, there are also green and black that represent different types of ability, and the lowest in knight ranking is the red belt. Only those who perform badly in tests will get it, and those who get white belts will get special guidance, personal tutors, and rewards for additional resources. Meanwhile, those with red belts aren't so lucky. They will receive basic training and have no one to care about them. Most time can do whatever they want, but to put in bounty, the academy abandons them, and Lei thinks if this happens, then he doesn't need to hurt more beasts, and he might be able to gain a higher rank crystal and ability. He decides to think of a way to get the red belt. A week later, they finally reach their destination, and the students are impressed to see that the city gate is as tall as a hundred-story building. The place is called Aviron Academy, and students think they have heard of it before, but they didn't expect the academy to be so grand. This academy is a city, and everyone is a knight there. Magic crystals provide the academy's energy, and they don't even have to use torches. Gray says, this is a completely different world compared to the village where he grew up, and the knight asks them to follow him quickly, and if they get separated, then he won't care. He takes them to the armory and then shows them the academy library, where they don't accept chattering. He tells the students that all graduating students are required to volunteer at Aviron Academy for two years, whether to go or stay after that is entirely up to their own personal preference. After some time at the end, before going to the dormitory, he takes them to the guide's final stop, and Lei thinks this place is a cemetery. The knight reveals that this place is the burial place of the knights who died fighting for the kingdom of Allur. He asks them to remember that the war never ends, and they need to remember the knight's mission. He advises them to fight to defend and protect their homeland. But Lei is getting furious to see that those people used their dragon race's body to make their armor and weapons. Naslavia calls the knight and asks whose statues these are, and he replies that those people are the founders of the Avrian Academy, the legendary Dragon Knight. Lei asks him what the Dragon Knight is, and he replies that they will know when they leave the Academy's history. He asks everyone to follow him. Lei is surprised that the knight ignored his question, while Grey suddenly wonders what happened to him and asks him to leave. He uses his dragon eye skill and discovers that the Baryan chamber is beneath the cemetery. He observes that there's something in it and finds it alive. After that, Gray says he doesn't know who he will be living with and hopes that it's some nice guy who can get along with, while Lei thinks about the living thing in the burial chamber and the state is also incredible, even if it's a monster. Gray calls him and asks if he listens to him and he apologizes to him, saying he was thinking about something different. Gray tells him that they both are in the same dormitory, and they hear Nislavia's voice, who is shocked to hear that they are sharing the same dormitories. Gray says it's unsurprising because he heard that the Academy has always treated the knights equally without gender differences. But she punches him away and says she won't stay with boys, and runs away saying she wants to change the dormitory room. However, they enter the room, Gray introduces himself and lay to Monk and Ian. Lay observes that Ian also has red hair, and Gray tells him they still have two more roommates, Dan and Martha. Lay feels like he has heard this name somewhere before. In the meantime, Neslavia comes back and says she will change clothes and warns them that they are not allowed to come in. Gray exclaims he already told them that she won't get to change dormitory rooms, and now she has to stay with them. Meanwhile, Dan also approaches them and asks why they are standing outside like this, and Gray replies that they have been waiting for him. Gray tells him that they discovered a big cockroach inside and are discussing who will go in and kill it. He enters the room saying he isn't scared of cockroaches and asks how a future knight can be afraid of a mere cockroach. He closes the door and soon they are all shocked to see noise coming from inside. 
After some time, all the students gather for dinner, and Dan asks them why they lied to him, he asks her if she will kill him while he is asleep. Gray replies it will be great because some people want to talk to her, but can't find a chance at all because of her bad temper. She hears their conversation and asks what they are talking about, and they get scared of her. She asks them how they can still eat since there will be an assessment soon, and Gray replies that he heard about it, but what does it have to do with eating? Meanwhile, some seniors come to them and say they have come from a poor place and are different from them. They make their fun, saying they will probably go home to find their mothers after eating a few meals. After that, they make fun of Ian's big physique and say he is destroying a chair by just sitting on it. They call it disgusting that all these red-headed freaks have come from Rainy Town while Duo is holding his brother's hand and asks him not to say anything. Meanwhile, Monk stands up and says they are going overboard, and they make him fun too. He says he can, at most, get a red belt. Ian asks him to sit down, and they call him sensible and ask them to avoid them in the future. Suddenly, someone hits one of them from a side with a chicken piece, and he shouts at them and asks who did that. It is Lei who hit them, and now he puts them on the table and asks what he just said earlier, and he calls them disgusting red-headed monsters. He shouts for help and says someone is using violence against him. Ian tries to stop him and says he didn't hurt him, and Grey also asks him not to make it a bigger trouble because the knights are watching them. But he doesn't care and grabs him tightly, and his friends call Night Lord to save him quickly and say this redhead is using violence on other students. The knight reaches there and asks Lei to let go of him, and Lei calls Ian and says there is one thing he has known since he was a kid. He tells him that if someone wants to climb over his head and bully him, he must show him some colors, breaking the student's arm with this. Everyone is shocked to see that he calls Ian and asks him to see that, only if he teaches them a lesson then they will learn their lesson. The knight gets furious and asks why he didn't obey his order, and he apologizes to him, saying his ears are like his, and they have some problems and can only hear things he wants to hear. The knight becomes answerless, and he asks Grey to come and eat their food, and they can't let them spoil their appetite. The knight lord stares at him angrily, and Lei Talon has become top of his hate list. In the meantime, three great knight lords enter there, indicating the time for assessment. Winford comes forward and asks everyone to remain silent, and they first invite the Dean of Avrian Academy, the Six Elders. Everyone is getting nervous about them, and thinks no one told them the Six Elders would come to watch the assessment. Lei observes that these six people's aura are so strong, just like those people who killed him back then. It is the announcement that under the witness of the six elders, a new round of night assessment will be conducted for all of them. This time, they will give everyone a different color night belt due to their assessment results. If they perform poorly, then they will get the red belt which means they are failures. Winford encourages them, saying even if they get the red belt, they can also stand in his position in the future. They need to believe that they were chosen at five years old, they are more talented than ordinary people, and future training will help them to develop their talent, so they don't need to be discouraged. Lei is impressed by him and thinks this man still speaks encouraging words, and he wonders what his expression look like when he gets a red belt. Winford calls Lancey and says he will leave it to him, and he asks him not to worry since he will do his duty well. It is revealed that there will be five different stages, testing different aspects of the knight's overall ability. Stone of Power, Blazing Inferno, Undetected Passage, Eye of Precision, and Will of Truth. They start the first stage, Stone of Power, and the rules are simple, they just need to push this big rock over there, and once it reaches the goal position, they will be done with this stage. Lancey announces that everyone has two chances, and if they fail on their first day, they can use this pair of magic gloves on their second chance. The glove will increase their strength and aid them in passing this stage, and using it also affects their evaluation, so they have to keep that in mind. Gray says this looks pretty easy, and Lei also says it looks like a piece of cake. He feels someone doesn't want him to pass this test, and Lancey has something to announce before the test begins. He states that as the proctor of this test, he rejects Lei Talon's participation, and Nasalavia asks him why he is not allowed to be tested. Lancey warns them, saying they must follow any orders given to him by his superiors, first and foremost. If anyone objects to his decision, they may all report this to his superiors, and if they tell him to retract it, he will agree without any objections. 
Gray says it looks like he has completely gotten on his bad side, and Nasalavia says he should report this to higher-ups because he can't treat him like this. Lei refuses by saying this actually makes things easier for him and asks them to go ahead and get tested, and he will join them on the next stage. He is happy that he is guaranteed a red belt, while Naslavia is shocked at his calmness. Soon, Gray and Naslavia pass the test, and Lei congratulates Gray and says the second stage will probably be hard for him, so he should be prepared. He asks him to show him the proctor of the second stage, and from the looks of it, he is from Roland. Gray cries at this, saying they have never learned magic before and how they are supposed to get tested. Lei exclaims the battlefield doesn't care whether he has learned something or not, and he guesses that they are going to have to try resisting magic. Usually, stronger people physically end up having worse magic resistance, and he assumes that they are trying to test their strengths and weaknesses through these five tests to find the best way to develop their abilities. Gray brags by saying he is an all-rounded genius, and they exclaim that they will start the test soon. The second stage, Blazing Inferno, starts, and the magician checks up their stamina, and Gray's is 57 seconds. Lei appreciates him and says he lasted pretty long, but he is not happy that he didn't even last a full minute. One of the knights also appreciates him saying he did really well because only a single minute passes in the outside world for every hour in the illusion created by that magic. Next is Naslavania's turn and she knows that is an illusion and thinks they can't scare her. Soon the students are impressed by her because she's already five minutes in and leagues ahead of the second place. The old man lifts his hand and says she has passed the test and has proven herself, and the next one is Lei Talon in the line. He thinks he will last only for 20 seconds, or he should be giving up immediately. Everyone is excited to see his talent, and he finds himself in a dragon's mouth as an illusion. He is shocked to see that the dragon is his past life, and he kicks the old magician trying to get out of the illusion. The knights and deans are shocked to see his behavior, and the old man shouts at him, saying the red dragon has cursed him. Everyone also wonders why the proctor fell down, and they already knew that the red-headed guy was a piece of bad news and was much more dangerous than the other red hairs. Lay asks Winford about the proctor's condition, and he replies that he is alright and just tired. He is also surprised that his man's completely drained, which doesn't make sense. He reports to the dean that it's just a mana disorder caused by using too much mana, and it may be due to using too much mana when testing the students. But they also wonder how a mage from the renowned Roland Magic Academy can be drained of all his mana after a test of this degree. Winford replies he has arranged for him to have some rest for now, and he will continue investigating this matter, he suggests having another mage take his place for the remaining tests. The dean calls a knight and gives him a message, and he replies that he will be done the task immediately. After that he just stares at Lei Talon and wonders about his condition. After that they go to their dormitories and Naslavia tells them that a man disorder is when a mage has no mana left but forcefully casts magic. It ends up backfiring on the mage's body, and that's what mana disorder is called. Gray says Lei is very unlucky because the mage passed out having his test, and Lei brags by saying geniuses always have it hard. Nezalavia is also shocked at how a mage from the Roland Magic Academy makes such an elementary mistake. Suddenly, the earth shakes very hard, and they all think this is an earthquake, but later find out that it is due to the magic. The entire testing area is filled with trees, and they start coughing and wondering what is going on, it seems like someone cast a spell on them. The mage announces that the third stage starts now, and the man introduces himself as the proctor of the third stage. They all have to follow him and replicate his movements the best they can, and the name of the third stage is Undetected Passage. He starts his movements and disappears from sight in just an instant. Monk follows his movements, and after him, Lei and Grey also follow them. Naslavia also jumps on a tree, saying she can't lose to them, and there is only one left, and shouts at them to wait for him. The proctor thinks this is probably too hard for those kids, and he should wait for them. But he is impressed by their movements and is shocked to see they have approached him. There is no need to take it easy, and he runs away, asking them to catch him up if they can. Suddenly, someone attacks them with arrows while Lei is out of breath and thinks he is not good at this, and he likes to move with all four limbs. The proctor asks them to look out for the arrows with for the arrows with his speed too. They don't need to hold back that much, and there are too many of them, and his partner says she is going to pick his slack. 
The proctor says these kids are pretty good, and they will see, and she asks the students to stand there and keep following him, otherwise they will lose him. After a while, they find many bows there, and Lei says they are going to do the fourth stage too, and they wonder if they are testing them on the accuracy of their bows. They have set up the targets in the forest ahead and will pass after hitting three targets under his interference. With this, the fourth stage, Eye of Precision, starts and Lei thinks he is fine with getting a red belt, but he doesn't want to come in last. He uses the dragon's eye and sees an arrow coming toward him at full speed. He pushes another student away and asks him to watch out, but in the process he can't dodge it. But before the arrow can hit him, another arrow appears from the side and hits the arrow. He thinks this is too strong for a simple test, and the proctor asks them if they are all right. Gray replies that they are fine and praises her attack, and she replies that if it weren't because she was close to them, then she could not have done it. Lei shouts and asks them to watch out because some other arrows are coming, and he observes that the one that came to them just now was enveloped in Kai, and is completely different from the arrows that the proctor has shot at them. Someone really wants to kill them, or maybe they want to kill him, specifically. The proctor is also there, ready to attack them, and in the meantime, Lei tries to attack him again. But he comes forward and attacks first and breaks his bow. The proctor runs behind the attacker and attacks him from behind, but he dodges his attack and disappears in the darkness. He is shocked to see such speed and he was able to dodge an all-out attack from him without leaving a single trace behind. He wonders who wants to attack their students. However, he asks the students to continue the test and tells them that his attack went astray. Lei thinks he clearly didn't shoot that arrow and he is just trying to reassure them and it looks like someone really dangerous managed to sneak in there. Soon, the test ends and the students are discussing their performances, while Naslavia is shocked to hear that something like that happened. She asks Lei and Grey why they didn't report this to the knights, and he replies that it's better not to tell them. Grey also agrees with him and says the proctor just now didn't tell them the truth, and while she could have been trying to reassure them, she might have been trying to hide something. If someone really were trying to cause them harm, then that person must be someone who could enter the venue unnoticed. They assume that the person who attacked them could be a proctor of a related knight. She asks them what they are planning to do now, and she replies that they will see how it goes. He is really quite curious about who he is. On the other side, the proctor catches the person and asks him to stop from behind. He asks why he was trying to attack the students. He asks him not to move because he is confident that he can shoot him down on the spot at this distance. But the person turns back and is ready to attack him, saying there is nothing more to say. At the same time, Delbert starts the fifth stage, Will of Truth, and states that the test is to check their willpower and their Kai manipulation. He shows them a sword that is made from an ultra beast crystal from a firebird, and it releases flames when they hold it like this. They may not have learned how to use Kai yet, but they can try controlling it with their willpower by concentrating their spirit. He calls the first student to come forward and asks him to hold the sword. The sword releases a large amount of fire which makes him scared, and Delbert calls the next student. On the other side, the assassin informs an elder named Gibby that he not only fail, but was also discovered by the proctor. He replies that he never expected to solve this issue immediately either, but he supposes that it has sent a signal to their followers. He wears a golden mask by which the user is able to change their appearance, and he wants to send a message that the Pureblood Guild has never disappeared. At the same time, Delbert calls Grey, and he grabs the sword bravely, and next is Lay's turn, and Grey wishes him good luck. When he comes back, Naslavia asks him if Lay is strong, and he replies that, according to his knowledge, he is extremely strong. But they are surprised because his results for the first four tests were terrible, and he replies that he won easily the last time they fought. However, ten years ago, he was attacked by an intermediate-ranked demonic wolf, and Lei was the one who defeated it and saved him. Dan laughs and says he is just joking because they were just five years old back then, and how he can defeat an intermediate-ranked beast. He says it was probably a big wolf. While Naslavia wonders if he is really that strong, then why is he hiding his abilities? His test begins, and as soon as he grabs the sword, a status window appears there saying he has obtained an ultra-grade burst crystal and asks him if he wants to absorb it. Delbert is shocked to see that there aren't any flames and Lei assumes that the sword is broken. Delbert grabs the sword from him and is shocked because this is a weapon created from an ultra-grade beast crystal, a treasure of the Allure Kingdom. 
He grabs Lei furiously and asks what he did with the sword, and he calmly asks him what he can do with a weapon made from an ultra-grade beast crystal after all. Suddenly, a knight calls him from behind and says there is an urgent report and whispers something in his ears. He then leaves quickly, saying the test has ended and they can return to their rooms now. He then asks them to gather at dinner time and they will be given their belts. He also asks Lei to leave and he wonders if what that knight just said is true. He heard their conversation and he told him that the proctor of the fourth test was just found to be killed. When they found her, he had already died and his body was still warm, so it hadn't been very long. Delbert is shocked to see his body and asks the knights to report this to the elders immediately. On the other side, at the elder meeting room, the knight informs them that the fourth proctor seems to have been killed with a single attack and the perpetrator must have been fairly skilled. Something else of note is that none of the alarms set for intruders were triggered, which means the elder Gibby says it could be very possibly be an internal case. There have always been rumors about certain groups after all. The other elder says it can be the Pure Blood Guild or the Dark Guild, and this is outrageous that the captain of the Green Belted Knights was killed in an exam. They ask the head elder about his opinion, and he replies that not a word of this is allowed outside the doors and orders the knight captains to continue investigating. After some time, all the students gather in the dining room, and they are excited about the belts to be given to them. Lei thinks about the proctor and thinks they managed to kill a proctor and it must be someone from the higher-ups. He thinks if they are only looking within the confines of the academy, then it could either be the commanders or the elders. Gray calls him and asks if he remembers the adventurer they came across on their way to Rennie all those years ago, and that woman turned out to be Martha's mother. When Lei doesn't respond to him, he shouts at him and asks what he is thinking about, and he replies that he is thinking about the test. Naslavia asks him if he is thinking about the person who shot that arrow, and he replies that he is just thinking why that sword in the fifth test doesn't respond to him at all. He thinks he shouldn't tell them that the proctor was killed, and it would only become more dangerous. She also finds it strange and is about to say something more when the knight commanders arrive. Winford announces that they are going to hand out their knight belts and asks them to come up there when their name is called. The first one is Grey Blue Blood, and everyone praises him for being first because he did the best overall. Winford states that after careful consideration by the knights, he is given a black belt. He is disappointed because he thought he would have been given a white belt. After that, Ian received the white belt, and the students whispered that the red-haired monster got a white belt. Mislavia also receives a white belt, while Monk is crying with happiness that he received a black belt. Lei Talon is called at last and everyone thinks he will get a red belt, but he is shocked when Winford reveals that after careful deliberation by the knights, he shall be given a black belt. Monk is shocked and asks why he is given a black belt after doing so badly, and he is also shocked at why he is given a black belt after this bad performance. Winford announces that all the belts have been given out, and these are the results, no matter whether they accept them or not. Starting tomorrow, they will be undertaking training from different knights according to the colors of their belts. A knight sees their results and is surprised that there are two red-headed on the top of the list. He asks them not to get him in trouble anymore. The next day, at the training grounds, the black belt students are waiting for their instructor, while the others are gone after their training. Meanwhile, the instructor appears behind them and asks Kyle if he is talking about him. They start following him, and Kyle asks if he mentioned his name Gray asks him to ask his name by himself. He asks the instructor how they can address him, and he replies that they can call him Kay. They face Delbert while walking, and he makes fun because of two red-haired students on the list. He then calls Lei and says he must be over the moon getting a black belt, and if he was the one making the decision, he wouldn't have allowed someone like him to appear in the academy in the first place. He warns him to watch his movements and that he will be keeping an eye on him. But Knight K calls him and says he wants to remind him that the Lay Talon is now a member of the Black Belted Knights. He says it wouldn't be good if they let discrimination, and Delbert says they will see its discrimination soon enough, and everyone will find out that the prophecy is wrong sooner or later. He leaves them and Gray asks Knight K what prophecy he was talking about, but he stays quiet and doesn't answer them. He takes them to a building and tells them that they will be having special training there from now on. They feel an ominous wind coming there and they can't even open their eyes. The place is decrepit and they get scared to see that the Knight K has disappeared and they don't notice when he disappeared. 
Suddenly, the door closes behind them and Lei uses his dragon's eye to see and he can't even find him with his dragon's eye. Grey asks him if he can see Knight K, but he appears from behind and asks them if they are looking for him. He then tells them that from now on, they are going to be training in complete darkness, and he will further their abilities and polish their senses until the day they can become one with the darkness and turn it into their sharpest weapon. Grey asks him if the Black Belted Knights will be dispatched on assassination missions in the future, and he replies that he has abilities that make him more suited to carry out assassination missions than others, so that's how the cookie crumbled. He is disappointed and asks why they can't fight fair and square like others, and he tells them that they were all chosen in the first place because they have special qualities that others don't, and they can fight fair and square if they want to. He gives them some black belts and says from now on, they can fight however they would like. Later, his ranking is 300 and his today's training has been completed. He assumed that the watch shows their current ranking, and according to what Sir Kay said, the rankings would be renewed every day after practice. Students of the same grade can challenge each other at will, and if the lower-ranked student wins, they will take the place of higher-ranked students. The higher the rank, the more resources they can get. He asks Gray how many students are there in their grade, and he replies that there are about 300 students. He is disappointed that he is close to last, and asks Gray about his ranking. He replies that he ranks first and today's completion rate is 100%, and Monk shouts at him because they were guessing who the first place was. He is in the same form as the first and third ranked, and the girls ask him why they are shouting. Naslavia is at third rank, and Martha is at 89th number. Ian asks Monk why he is so happy, and he is at rank 65 and thinks he will continue working hard. Ten days later, Lei thinks he didn't get too much from hunting and is so close to 100 points for beginner beast crystals. He can only go up in rankings because of this special training and Monk has reached rank 50. Gray says he can keep his ranking without them anyway, and he asks Ian what they are talking about. He replies that this is the first time he has seen Monk so agitated, and they are arguing about whether the special training for black belts is useful or not. Indeed, Grey isn't good at stealth, assassination, and hiding one's traces, while Monk, on the other hand, has shown great talent for it. Grey is not exactly wrong either, because he is better than Monk in all the basics, and even though Monk is becoming strong quickly, Grey is still stronger than him overall. They are now arguing and Monk says he can't just put down his hard work like that, and Grey asks him to think whatever he wants. Naslavia interrupts them and asks them to stop, while Lei suggests they fight and check who is stronger. Monk agrees with him and asks Grey to have a rank battle and Grey also says they will see if those skills he loves so much are useful in battle. Soon, the news spread everywhere that someone was challenging the first ranker in a rank battle. It is another black belt who has ranked pretty high too, while Sebastian, Delbert's youngest son, says there is nothing much to look at and calls them just some country bumpkins from Rennie. Kylie announces their battle and says there is a top star Grey versus the black horse Monk. Dan makes a bet of 10 pieces of silver on Grey, and Naslavia shouts at him and asks how he can bet on his roommates like that. In the meantime, Martha bets on Monk and says he may surprise them. Naslavia asks Lei if he thinks Monk has a chance, but before he can reply, they enter the ground. Kyle announces the start of the battle, and Lei asks Naslavia if she thinks Grey will win. Kyle asks them to start the fight, and they rush toward each other to attack. They think Grey is definitely gifted and has great techniques, while Monk has worked harder than anyone else on special training. According to them, Grey is the greatest rival right now, and Monk doesn't stand a chance against him. Monk uses his technique and attacks Grey, causing destruction there. He wonders if his technique worked, but Grey blocks his attack. He asks Monk to give up because he can't win, while Lei says Monk has definitely improved a lot and Grey has to deal with him carefully. He yawns and says Grey will win, and Naslavia says it looks like he can't fill in the gap within their abilities, not in such a short time at least. Now it's Grey's turn, and he rushes toward him to attack and passes by him by breaking his word and making him fall. He exclaims that the fight is over, while Monk is shocked at what just happened to him. Grey loses his guard, thinking the fight is over, but Monk furiously rushes toward him, saying the fight is not over yet. Everyone shouts at him to watch out and asks Monk to stop while to Grey to watch out, but before he can attack him. Lei reaches there and grabs the sword from behind. 
They are shocked when he reaches there, and Lei asks Monk to stop the fight because it is enough for them. Monk throws the sword and apologizes to him. Mesolavia thinks Monk was so fast that she couldn't even catch his movements, yet Lei managed to get up there in such a short time. Monk apologized to them, saying he was too rash and that it would have been very bad if he didn't stop him. Now, the question is who won the fight, because if Lei hadn't stopped him, then Grey probably wouldn't have been able to win. Kyle asks them to calm down, and since someone stepped in, the result won't count, and they will get the money back. But they can't calm and throw a bottle toward him saying he did it on purpose, while he is just saying that he will give their money back. They call them a bunch of red-haired freaks and throw multiple things toward them, saying they could have one more money. A stone also hits Lei while Monk asks them to calm down, but no one listens to them. Grey asks Lei if he is okay, and he asks him to leave the ground immediately. Now Savia and Martha are also scared by the situation, and Sabastain's friend also picks up a stone saying they will see if they like this one. But Monk hits him from behind and asks him not to do that, but he shouts at him, saying it's all because he is useless. They all blame Lei for all this and call him a monster, freak and many other names, and say nothing good ever happens when he is around. He wonders why it is always like this and why those filthy humans are always like this. Hearing those venomous words, it was almost as if a wave of toxic sludge enveloped him, and they all asked him to get out of there. He furiously thinks they are all the ones who should die. Meanwhile, Winford appears there and asks everyone to stop, and the students wonder what he is doing there. Gray tells him that Lei is bleeding a lot and needs to be healed immediately, but he refuses to take his help and asks him if there is something he needs. He informs him that his mother has come there, and he is shocked to hear this. He runs toward the room where she is and greets her. She is happy to see that he has grown up while Winford is listening to their conversation from outside. He asks her about his father's condition and if he gets better than before, and she reveals that his father has gone. He surprisingly asks her if his father has died, and she replies that he left the house and also left the village. He asks her how this can be possible because he was confined to his bed and couldn't able to move. Winford is listening to their conversation and thinks he can't bring himself to tell Lay the truth about the plague of shadows in the past, but those who are infected usually die within a year, and very few manage to hold on as Jack did. However, in the end, those strong survivors end up becoming slaves to the shadows, becoming vectors that spread the plague even further, and there has never been an exception to this. His mother reveals that she only knew that day how much his father fought against the plague of shadows for this past decade. She heard a noise from his room and was shocked to see that he was writing something on sitting on his table. She hugged him and asked when he woke up, but he was trying to control his plague and he couldn't control it much longer. He asked his wife to kill him, but she started crying and said she couldn't do that. The shadow monster was overcoming him, and she asked him about what was happening to him. Suddenly, he released a large amount of shadow energy and asked Scarlet to kill him at the moment. He turned into a monster and asked her again and again to kill him, but she couldn't do it. She cries and says he is his father, giving him a letter that his father left for him. He apologized to him that he couldn't grow up with him, and from the day they set their eyes on him, they knew that he was special. He knew that Lei got into the Night Academy, and he also knew that he was much stronger than he let show. For that, he was very proud. He apologized to him because he couldn't be with him any longer and he hoped that he could live his life as he wished. He reads the letter and wonders why he wrote it as if these were his last words and thinks he will find a way to save him. Later, he thinks about his conversation with his mother that she wanted to find his father and says she will find him no matter what he becomes. He also asks to join her, but she refuses by saying he has his own path to take and she is sure that his father would want this. She hugged him and was happy that she was able to see him. He hasn't done anything for them or improved in the slightest for a decade, just like a human. He couldn't take revenge for his race or protect those he holds dear. Meanwhile, Gray enters the room and asks him if he met his mother, but he leaves without saying anything. Gray thinks something is definitely off with him and finds out the letter Lay's father gave. He is about to read it when Dan snatches the letter and says he was looking at it so intently so this must be a love letter from a fangirl. Gray tries to grab the letter back while others wonder what they are doing. After some time, Gray tells everyone about Lei's father that the plague of shadows infected him, and he had such a rough childhood. 
After some time, Lei is in the cafeteria when Martha and Naslavia approach him and ask him to have lunch with them. After some time, Naslavia washes and presses his clothes for him and Ian says she must like him. He wonders what happens to their behavior. Gray gives him fresh lilies the next day and says he just thought that seeing freshly picked flowers would help brighten things up around there. He asks Gray if he fell in love with him, while he shouts and says this is impossible. He asks them what they are doing these days, and he apologizes to him, saying he accidentally saw his letter. He apologizes for interrupting his privacy but smiles and says they all are best. Suddenly, others bring Monk to the dormitory, who is in a very serious condition and is bleeding badly. They tell them that it was Sebastian who provoked Monk into getting into a rank battle with him. Lei asks him if they don't end immediately once one party surrenders and asks them how he got hurt badly. He tells him that Monk has already passed out and he hasn't had the chance to surrender yet, but he doesn't stop and keeps on beating him up. He asks Monk about his condition and Monk apologizes to him for not being able to help him make his bed for the next few days. Naslavia says his limbs are fractured and they need to get a doctor, but Lei angrily leaves the room. Gray asks him where he is going, and he replies that he is going to get back at him for what he did to Monk. Gray tries to stop him and asks him not to be rash, and he asks him if he wants to join him and says he wants an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Naslavia also stops him, saying Sebastian is from House Delbert, and Gray also says he is the youngest son of Sir Delbert, and they can't get on his bad side. But Lay doesn't to them and says he started it, so he should pay for what he did. Gray tries to persuade him, saying this isn't the first time he has done something like this, and no one in this academy wants to cross him, and he might get expelled. But he raises his hand and says he is not that dumb, and if he can challenge him in an official rank battle, he can get back at him rightfully. They call him from behind, but it's too late for them, and he reaches the place where all of them are practicing. They call him and say he is not one of them, and they are practicing, so he needs to wait over there. Lei asks them which one of them is Sebastian, and they ask him why he is looking for Sebastian when he never talked about having a red-haired friend. A boy named Eric asks them about what is happening there, and they tell him that this guy wants to barge in there, so he is looking for Sebastian. Eric replies Sebastian doesn't know any red-haired freaks, and asks him if his parents never taught him manners. Lei asks him if he is Sebastian, if he is not, he has no business with him. Meanwhile, Sebastian reaches there and sees his black belt means he has come for his friend. He directly calls him and asks him to have a fight with him, but he refuses. Lei asks him if he is scared of him, and he laughs at his rank, saying it's not going to be much of a fight. He thought the other black belt was the strongest among them, but he was too weak. He apologizes to him and says he didn't hurt him on purpose, and this is probably the natural gap between the peasants and them. He turns back, saying he doesn't want it to happen again, and Eric also says Sebastian might not be stand to his level to fight him. But he can fight with him, and tells him that he is currently ranked ninth, so other people might be interested in fighting him if he can fight him. Lay asks Sebastian if he wins against him, then he will accept his request, and he says they will talk about it later. Lay asks Eric to come at him, and he rushes to attack him, saying he doesn't need to cry for someone to take revenge later. He thinks this is a good chance for him to show his stuff, and he will use what Sebastian taught him, while he looks towards him confidently. He swings his sword and rushes toward him, but he dodges his attack with just one movement. Eric is shocked to see that and wonders how he dodged it, and comes at him again saying it's not over yet. He attacks him again and again, but he dodges him every time. This is the fastest he can attack, but he is still dodging everything. In the meantime, Lei punches his face forcefully and throws him away, and everyone is shocked to see him getting defeated by a junior. He then asks Sebastian if he is qualified enough to fight him now, and he is also surprised to see that he has passed out. He asks him what good it will do for him to win against him, and he shows him two intermediate beast crystals he can get if he wins against him. Sebastian is shocked to see them and asks where he got them. He says he doesn't want to get in trouble for getting dirty goods. Lei tells him that his parents are adventurers and they left this for him and says he still has the chance to get them and he hasn't used them for equipment. Sebastian accepts his challenge but he has a condition that the rank battle has to be held in public. Lei replies he wants it that way to begin with and soon everyone gathers on the ground to cheer for Sebastian. Kyle asks Lei if he really wants to fight with him and he hears that he is ranked second 
and even if he wants to earn a quick buck by getting on himself losing, he won't hold back. He then asks Lei to promise him that he will get a nosebleed out of him. He then asks everyone to make a bet for them, and Dan asks Ian and Naslavian what they think about this fight. She replies that it will not be that simple, and Dan makes fun of her, saying love really makes people blind. She shouts at him, asks what he is talking about, and says she doesn't like Lei. Meanwhile, instead of worrying about whether Lei can win, Grey is more worried about whether Sir Delbert will get mad at him for this. Sebastian makes fun and says the children of knights will become knights, and the children of farmers will become farmers. He says Lei has become slightly more confident after beating Eric, but he will quickly see the difference between them after fighting him. They start the fight on the count of three, and everyone is wondering about the outcome of the result. The fight starts and Sebastian rushes toward him to attack. There is an explosion there. Lei dodges his attack, and Sebastian says he is lucky because not a lot of people can dodge his first attack. He asks him to come at him with his full power, and if this is all he got, then he can never win against him. Lei asks him why he talks too much and if he has been winning all this time because of his mouth. He gets angry about this and rushes toward him to attack, but he dodges him this time too, and Lei attacks him back in just one slash and hurts his leg and face. Everyone is shocked that Lei attacked him just now, and no one could catch it either. Grey wonders when Lei learned this type of attack and how he dodged Sebastian's attacks just like how Sir Kay did it. This time, Sebastian prepares a stronger attack and says they will see if he can dodge this one. The students are getting excited to see that his Kai is converging on his sword, which will be good. This time, Lei again dodges his attack and Sebastian knows that he will do that and attacks him by changing his pattern. He pushes him behind and asks him to dodge his attacks this time. This time, it is getting difficult for him to dodge his attack. Dan shouts from his place and says Ray has been dodging this whole time, so he is bound to get hit. Gray asks them not to worry because he thinks Ray is alright, and Naslavia also asks them to look closer because the one who is really at a disadvantage there is Sebastian. He gets hit in multiple places, and everyone is shocked at how that happened because Ray has been dodging this whole time. Gray tells them that he has actually been attacking the entire time, and every time he dodged Sebastian's attacks, he would at least counterattack once. He has been continuously chipping away at Sebastian, exhausting his stamina, and he shouts at him, saying even his father hasn't beaten him like this. He rushes toward him, saying he will kill him this time, but Lei attacks him and hits his face badly. Everyone is shocked to see that he is really Lei and that strong. Naslavia asks Grey why Lei is stretching the fight when he can win immediately. Lei is doing it on purpose and wants to torture him little by little, playing with him, just like a predator would do to its prey. Sebastian is shocked at his injured face and shouts at him. He observes that Lei wants to take revenge for Monk. Lei attacks him again, and this time, cuts his nose and Sebastian threatens him saying his father won't let him off the hook. Lei exclaims that talking to someone like him wastes his time and energy and rushes to attack him again. Sebastian tries to surrender, but he doesn't give him the time and hits him with his sword. Lei thinks he won't be able to forfeit that easily and will get back everything he did to Monk. He beats him well, and Grey says if this goes on, he will definitely die. In the meantime, Monk appears from a building and asks him to stop. He asks why he asked him to stop, Sebastian also forfeits, and Lei Talon wins the match. His friends take him to the infirmary and say he should get those wounds stitched up, but he shouts at them and asks them to get out of his way. He calls Lei Talon and says they will see who has the last laugh. The same evening, at the Avrian Knight Academy, Central Building, Top Floor, Sir Delbert is at the point that they can't forgive him easily for this. Sir Kay asks him to calm down, and from the perspective of a knight, Ray Talon doesn't break any of the rules, so he shouldn't ignore the rules either. Delbert says if he really ignored the rules, he would have killed him on the spot, and he should take a good look at what he did to his son. The elders are quiet while he says he must have done it on purpose and he was born to be a fiend. One of the elders agrees with him and says the prophecy is true that the red-haired boy will destroy the kingdom. The other one says the prophecy also foretold that the red-haired boy might become the chosen savior of this world. The elders say this child has already shown signs of becoming a calamity, and this is why they should be all the more wary, and it would be easy to expel him. The head elder says the debate is meaningless, and if everyone has different opinions they must vote on it. 
he asks them to raise their hand if they agree with Lei Talon's expulsion, and three persons raise their hands for this. The head elder says their votes have been noted and asks them to raise their hands if they disagree. The results are three people in favor, six in disagreement, and two abstain, so the motion has not been passed. On the other side, Lei is on the dorm roof, resting, when Naslavia comes to him and says she didn't see him at the dorms, so he guessed he would be there. He exclaims that he just wanted to be alone for a while, and she asks him if he was thinking about Monk. Lei asks him how she knows and she replies that he might be different from regular people, but he is not good at talking or understanding people's emotions. However, she knows he is not a bad person, and every time she sees him confused or mad, she keeps wishing to help him somehow. She asks him to trust them a little more because they are all his friends, but he pushes her behind and shows her his dragon eye. She gets scared to see his eye, and he asks her if she is afraid of him. She replies that she knows that he is not a bad person, and that his eye really suits him. She asks him not to treat himself like a monster, while Lei is shocked at her reaction because he didn't expect her to react like this. He thinks things change immediately whenever he feels like he has seen how humanity truly is. It seems like he has still got a long way to go until he really understands humans. At the same time, Delbert gets out of the elder's room and thinks he doesn't care about prophecy and will kill Lei someday. Meanwhile, Elder Gibby calls him from behind and says he knows that he thinks knights should only come from noble blood. He says his point of view is interesting, and he has got his attention, and he bends before him and takes his leave. At the same time, a boy asks Nislavia about Lei Talon, and she tells him that he is upstairs. She is surprised by his appearance, thinks this person looks so familiar, and wonders if there is someone like this in their year. She goes to Lei, who thinks it is Naslavia, and asks her why she has returned, and he replies that he is not the person he might think he is. He introduces himself as Harry, Harry Delbert, a second-year student. He tells him that the one he defeated today is his little brother, and Lei asks him if he wants to take revenge. He says he has misunderstood his intentions, and it's not because of anything that petty, but he wants to thank him. He knows how arrogant his brother can be, and he has never practiced in earnest in the past. It was a matter of time before he was defeated, so he should be able to learn a good lesson from this, while Lei says if he doesn't want to say anything else, then he is leaving. Harry says they can't have a rank battle because they are not in the same year, but he wants to teach him a lesson as well. He asks him to grab the sword because he still has to do something as an older brother. Lei asks him if he was just talking and has come there to fight him, and Harry says he just wants to see how strong the person who defeated his brother is. He asks him to come to him and show what he has got, and Lei thinks he doesn't like going on the offensive, but he gives him a different feeling than everyone else. He jumps upon him to attack, but Harry blocks his sword and pushes him away. He praises him, saying he made the correct decision, Lei thinks this is a strange feeling, and usually, his opponent's sword would have already broken after that attack. But this time, he is sure that if this continues, then his sword will break first, and Harry says it looks like he doesn't know how to use Kai yet. Lei thinks he can't win based on pure strength, so he will use the black belt techniques he learned, but Harry dodges him this time too. He then asks him if this is all he has got, and attacks him with his strength to push him away. Lei falls to the ground, and his mouth starts bleeding, and Harry says it looks like they are ending this fight there, and leaves, saying this is all for today. Lei calls him from behind and asks if he is the first-ranked second-year knight apprentice, and he replies that he is ranked 50th. He asks him to fight him again after he can use his Kai properly, and Lei wonders if he can become that strong after learning how to use Kai. A few days later, Winford informs the head elder that the situation is not very good at the border, and more and more knights have gone missing lately. He tells him that their enemies are not only from outside, but also from within and there are rumors that the Dark Guild has already infiltrated the academy. He says they should have the students be wary, and the head elder asks him to bring those five children to him, and they should let them know of their calling. At the same time, Lei tried many times to converge his aura into his body, but it never ended up working. The rain started, so he decided to stop for the day. He gets up to leave his room when he sees some people on the roof and wonders what those people are doing. He wonders if they are planning an ambush, and uses his dragon eye to see them closely. Their aura is purple, which means it's the Plague of Shadows, and he wonders if they have something to do with his father. They are following an elder and blocking his path, 
and the Elder says it looks like the rumors of the Dark Guild infiltrating the Academy are true. One of them says he realizes it is too late, and the Dark Guild will take over the entire Academy soon, and no one will be able to stop them. The Elders say they are four against one, and it is nothing like a challenge to lose the body after a long time. In the meantime, Lei jumps there and says they are now two against four, and the Elder asks him if he is one of their students and apologizes to him for getting him involved in this. The assassins say it doesn't matter, and now they both will die. The Elder asks Lei to help him keep those two occupied. He releases his Kai, and Lei is surprised to see this amount of Kai and thinks this is something else. Meanwhile, the assassin rushes towards him, and he thinks they still have their consciousness intact and not like his father. He jumps upon them and dodges their attack. He then disappears and appears from behind, but they react quickly and block his attack. They observe that this kid doesn't know how to use Kai, which means he is just immature. Lei thinks it's not good that they found him out, and they are surprised to see that he is using his mouth to bite his sword and wonder what he is doing. He uses his dragon's movements to dodge them, and they are unable to attack and catch him. He jumps on a wall, and an assassin asks others not to let him run, and they have to kill him. In the meantime, the elder has killed two of them, and he asks them to continue the fight because he wants to see what that child can do. The assassins get scared to see their partner's condition and wonder what they should do now. They decide to deal with that annoying kid before they do anything else, and Lei thinks it looks like the elder doesn't need his help. However, he has got a chance to fight, then he doesn't mind fighting, so he rushes toward them to attack them. They try to attack him, but he again dodges them and jumps to the wall taking the sword in his mouth. He then appears from behind and hits one of them, and one of them asks him not to be so full of himself. He reaches them and says they will see where he can run this time. The elder instructs him to grab his hand, pull him towards him, and turn around and use the momentum to throw him over. Lei follows his instructions and does the same as he says and throws him away. In the meantime, the elder reaches him and punches his face. There is an explosion and Lei is shocked to see his power while there is only one assassin left. The elder tells them that the knights have arrived there and Lei asks the assassin not to run from there. He tries to follow him but the elder asks him not to go after someone at the end of their rope. Suddenly, the status window appears and he achieves another ability mana siphoning. He is happy that after all these years of his struggle, he has achieved another ability. The knight asks the elder about his condition, and he says he will leave the rest to them. There is one that slipped away, so he chases after him if he wants. The knights split into two groups and continued their search. The elder thanks him for his help, and Lei asks him why they attacked him in the first place. The elder smiles and says he meets all sorts of strange people once he has lived a long enough life, and Lei thinks he is not wrong, but he feels like he is avoiding the topic. The elder says he doesn't know how to use Kai yet and asks him to join the martial arts club once he becomes a second year. Lei tries to stop him, but he leaves the place and disappears from his sight in a blink of an eye. Lei thinks he was just a strange old man and left like that. He then goes to his room where Winford is waiting for him and tells him that the head elder has summoned him. Lei wonders if he has been found out this quickly and reaches the place where the head elder is. He has called all the red-haired students and Lei wonders why he has called them too. The elder thanks them for taking the time to come there today and Kyle asks him if he has a special mission for them. The head elder says he is sure they would be bored if he went into detail so he will just get straight to the point. The reason why they all are summoned there today is because of a prophecy. He reveals that ten years ago, there was a prophecy from the heavens, and according to it, their land would one day be saved from the brink of destruction by a red-haired boy. Kyle asks him if he can be one of them, and the elder says after searching this land far and wide, they found ten children who fit the description. Lei thinks there are so many red-haired boys, and Kyle says there are only five of them there and asks him about the rest five. He reveals that the other five children had an aptitude for magic instead, so they are now students at the Roland Magic Academy. Lei thinks that is the same academy as Amy's, and this means that she probably already knows those people. He wonders how she is doing, and others are excited about saving the world. The head elder says it could be one of them, or it could be all of them, which is why he summoned all of them there today. He reveals that in the past, five dragon knights saved this land from peril, 
and they beat the shadows, founded the Avrian Knight Academy, and protected the common folk leaving behind a priceless heritage for them all. Now, the responsibility of protecting this heritage falls on their shoulders, which means that they all need to put in extra work. From today on, other than their basic training and the special training given for their respective belts, they will have to accept even more training. The five will become the Avrian Knight Academy's new generation of Dragon Knights. When they are leaving, they are excited about saving the world, and Lei calls Ian. He asks him if his red hair has always been red, and he replies that everyone there is like that, and he met a lot of trouble when he was growing up because of it. He also asked Kyle about this before, and their hair had always been red, while his hair turned from black to red. Putting aside whether he should continue as a Dragon Knight because of this, it's questionable how much of the Head Elder's words can be believed. He is sure that he must be hiding something from him. At the same time, Winford asks the Head Elder why he didn't tell the children about the entire prophecy, and he replies that they already have enough on their shoulders at their tender age. They should only let them know about some things when they are ready, and Winford understands what he is saying. The day after that, he did a lot of research regarding Dragon Knights, and he found out that people still think of dragons as symbols of evil and malice, and many don't even believe that these creatures existed. A minority still believes that in the distant past, this world wasn't plagued with shadows, and dragons were the protectors of this land. In many works of literature, Dragon Knights were lauded as mighty heroes, and within those books, he found one that stood out to him in particular. He read a book that recorded the personal information of the Dragon Knight themselves, including their equipment, weapons, skill in battle, and even their personalities. One other difference when it came to this book was that it mentioned the guidance of a god, and books that are written about god are forbidden for humans, so he couldn't find much more useful information about it either. He heard that god really existed and that he lived in the capital of the Allure Kingdom, close to the Roland Magic Academy. If it weren't for the fact that he couldn't leave Avrian Academy before he finished his night training, he would have immediately gone to have a chat with that god. He wants to ask him why he turned him into a human and compelled him to live like this. A year went by in the blink of an eye, and he spent this year with his training, as well as the hunting sessions that he would squeeze in when he had the time. Tomorrow would be the first day of their second year of training, and at night he heard Grey talking to someone while asleep. He goes to him and asks him to wake up and wonders if he is having a nightmare. Lei wakes him up and asks him why he is there, and Lei replies that he woke him up with all that noise. He replies that he just had a nightmare and asks him to go to his bed, and they will have a ceremony to get to tomorrow. He wonders what kind of nightmare he had to scare him this much. The next morning, his condition seems very bad, and Lei thinks it looks like that nightmare was something else. Naslavia greets them morning and asks if they picked a club he wants to join, and Lei asks her what she meant by the club. She shouts at him and says he should pay attention more than all the second-year students have to pick a club to join and be given training there. Lei asks her if she has already picked one, and she replies that she is joining the medic club, and Grey has picked up the swordsmanship club. He thinks someone told him to join a club or something but doesn't remember which club it was. He remembers the strange old man who told him to join the martial arts club and thinks he doesn't have any clubs he wants to join anyway, so he is supposed to look like he won't hurt. If it turns out to be boring, he can slip out and use the time to hunt beasts. He has recently obtained a new skill, mana siphoning. After obtaining his new ability, he found out that he didn't have any mana, and no wonder he failed the assessment all those years ago, and thinks maybe things will change once he starts absorbing intermediate beats crystals. He hasn't been able to act freely after winning against Sebastian since there are so many eyes on him, and his current ranking is still too high, so he thinks he needs to give up on some fights. He is looking for the club and reaches the end of the city, but hasn't found the martial arts club. After a long search, he finally finds the martial arts club, enters the gate, and wonders if there is not anyone there watching the entrance. He is surprised at how there can be a martial arts club in this beaten down place, and he finds a person who tells him that he has come there to join the martial arts club. There is no reaction from the other side, and he can't feel their presence. He approaches him and is about to touch him from behind. But the old man grabs his hand and makes him fall to the ground turning behind. He beats him well and asks how he dares to step into his turf, and Lei says he called him there earlier and wants to join the martial arts club. 
He recognizes him and asks if he is the one who helped him that day, and Lei asks him why he attacked a stranger without even knowing why they came there. He apologizes to him and says there have been a lot of strange people coming lately, so he has been a little tense. He is happy that he listened to his advice and says he will be his first student. Lei gets shocked and thinks this old man tricked him and wonders how he is supposed to slip away if it's one-on-one. -on -one. The old man says he didn't know how to use Kai back when he met him so they will start from the basics and he tells him that he doesn't know if he has heard of this saying, but when a fist imbued with Kai meet a sword, the sword will break. But when both sword and fist are imbued with Kai, the sword will win and Lei says martial arts is clearly on the losing side because there is no one to join it. But the old man says this is because they don't understand martial arts and once he learns what he teaches him, he will know his hands are his best weapons. Lei asks him about the people who attacked him the other day and he replies that they are from the Dark Guild and he will learn of them in his second year of studies, but they are a radical organization that aims to topple the Allure Kingdom. Their leader was a higher up of the Avrian Academy in the past and they created this organization after they were expelled from the Academy. Lei thinks, judging by their aura, they have everything to do with the Plague of Shadows, and they might know something about his father. He asks the old man why they were after him, and he replies that he shouldn't tell him so much, but he owes him a favor so he will tell him this. He reveals that they wanted him to die because he is one of the six elders of the Avrian Knight Academy. He might be old, but he is quite confident in his muscles, and he asks Lei to come to him and asks him to show what he has got. Lei thinks it seems like he knows him so that he will use his full strength, and he is an elder, so he doesn't have to worry about holding back. He punches him with his full power and thinks it's so hard and is just like hitting a metal board. The old man asks him if he used Kai in his attack, and he replies that he didn't use it. He gets happy and says he is even stronger than a bull and his potential is amazing, and once he gets the hang of Kai, he will soar into the heavens. Lei thinks this old man doesn't look very reliable to him, and he asks him to begin the training Lei isn't sure if he should join or not, but it's too late to leave. He starts to train him about Kai and says when they talk about Kai, they are referring to the energy that comes from within. As human beings, they can produce Kai just by breathing. The stronger he is physically, the more Kai they can utilize, and making Kai flow in their body is the key to grasping it so that they will transfer some Kai into their body. He will guide the Kai in his body with his and asks him to feel it flow through his body, and Lei feels it so warm and wonders if Kai can flow like this. Suddenly, the old man becomes unconscious and a status window appears there, showing he has activated his mana. He wonders why this system appears now, he tries to wake up the old man and thinks if he dies, then he will have to answer for it. He checks his heart, which is still breathing, and it looks like he just passed out. He then sees his status window and wonders if his mana siphoning is still activated because the system absorbed mana from his body when he was transferring Kai to him, and it is completely full now. He finds out that he accidentally absorbed all of his mana. Five minutes have passed and he hasn't woken up yet, and when ten minutes pass, he thinks to use the time to train himself. He uses the Dragon Eye skill and can see the flow of Kai inside his body, and Kai is converging into his solar plexus. Next, he thinks of circulating it within his body, but it disappears once he tries manipulating it. He tries to converge it again, but it disappears again. He wonders why his Kai flow is unstable, and he again tries to use more energy. This time, the flow of mana is stronger than before, and soon it starts to hurt him. The old man wakes up and is shocked to see the flow of energy inside his body. He shouts at him and asks what he is doing and asks him not to move. He gets up and tries to run away from him, but it's too late, and there is an explosion in his home. The old man is shocked and says he almost killed him now, and the amount of destructive power just from sucking it out of his body is huge. He tries to say something but passes out and falls to the ground. When he wakes up, he listens to Neslavia and Kyle's voices, and they are discussing that he should be woken up by now. He asks them about where he is, and Kyle tells him that he is in the hospital. Neslavia says the old man sent him there was a rush earlier, and they all got a great fright. Kyle says the old man even got the hospital's dean to check on him, and he asks him when he got to know someone like him. He gets up and asks Kyle to speak slowly because the volume of his voice is really high, and Neslavia tells him that the old man is really worried about him. 
he only calmed down after he was told by the dean that Lei would be fine and that he was recovering rapidly. He tells them that the old man is the instructor of the martial arts and asks Kyle what he is doing there. He replies that he has joined the medic club and he has always been interested in medicine, so he took the chance when he got it. Meanwhile, Gray appears there and asks him about his health, and Lei asks him if they have moved their dorms there. He asks him what he is doing there, and he replies that he just hasn't been sleeping very well lately, and he ran out of stamina during training just now, so he is there to get some rest. Lei still wonders about his nightmares and is worried about his health. The next day, he again goes to the martial arts club, but the old man shouts at him and asks how he dares to come back. He says if he wasn't there, then he could have died, and in the best situation, he wouldn't have been able to use Kai anymore. He then asks him to sit down and says he doesn't want to praise him, but being able to accumulate that much Kai in his first day is something else. He then asks him not to get cookie, and the size of his Kai can only be the size of a fist every time, not too big and not too small. Once he is familiar enough with it, they will continue to the next step. After he practiced the basics according to what the old man said, he could use Kai to strengthen any part of his body after five days. For the next few days, he trained to manipulate the Kai to where it was needed at the fastest speed possible. It has been difficult, but he ended up learning a lot. Today is the first time they are going hunting after becoming second years, and they reach the southern gates of Avrian City the next morning. The knights told them that there were three safe hunting grounds where the second years could hunt, and there they would be able to obtain beast crystals used for trading and equipment making. There are a few areas nearby where beasts mate, and the knight suggests they not stray off the path if they want to stay alive. They start their journey and soon reach the outer circle of the forest, and today each of the teams will head towards one of three hunting groundings before switching later. By doing so, they can become familiar with all sorts of different magical beasts. The proctor tells them according to the information, the hunting ground they are heading to is the insect forest. Meanwhile, Lei observes that something is still not quite right about Grey. Suddenly, a bug rushes toward them, and Naslavia asks them to be careful. It looks like a regular ladybug, so there is no need to freak out. But Kyle shouts at them and asks if they have ever seen a regular ladybug the size of someone's head. Suddenly, the proctor stabs the bug with an arrow kills it and asks everyone to be prepared because bugs may be weak, but they usually appear in swarms. Suddenly, a group of bugs appears from behind and everyone gets ready to fight them. But they are so large in numbers that it is getting difficult for them to overcome them. One of the bugs comes toward Lei and Naslavia asks him to watch out while he uses his Kai and tears it away. They are impressed by him because he already knows how to use Kai, and he says he will now try out the result of his training. They hear Gray's voice and are shocked to see that a bug has attacked him. Ian appears from a side and slashes the bug with his sword, and they ask about Gray about his health. He apologizes to them for having them worry about him, and Naslavia asks Ian to help her take off his armor, and she is going to perform first aid. Lei is shocked to see his condition and wonders how he got hurt by a beginner beast like that ant. He thinks he will ask him what's been going on when they get back. Naslavia has healed his wound a lot and Dan asks her if she has learned this from the magic club, and Kyle tells him that it can help cells recover faster, so it can be used for simple first aid. Lei thinks it seems like he is not the only one who learned some new tricks and he has to work harder. They have obtained a beginner beast crystal after all the fight, and Dan says they won't even be able to hit the tax limit for today. Lei asks him what the tax is, and surprisingly, he asks him if he hasn't learned the instructions. They have to hand up a tenth of their earning when they get the beast crystals at the hunting ground. This is the rule of the academy, and there are many more places where they have to hand up taxes down the line. Lei thinks it looks like he has to find a way to get it past Lancy. After some time, they reach the entrance of the hunting grounds. They all hand over their crystals to Sir Knight, and he asks Lei how he only got five beginner beast crystals when he is the last one out. He thinks he is just trying to trick him and asks him to take off his weapon, but he doesn't find anything to him. The knight shouts at him and says he must have hidden it somewhere on the mountains and warns him saying if he finds out that he has been hiding beast crystals, then he will punish him. Lei doesn't take him seriously and asks him to keep anything he finds, and Monk asks him how he did this because he knows that he got more than that. 
He found out about this a while ago that after saving the beast crystals in the system, the beast crystals in real life become useless rocks, but the system will always give him beast crystals directly after hunting magical beasts. Meanwhile, everyone else needed to find them from the bodies of the magical beasts, and in order to not garner suspicion, he asked the system not to extract beast crystals from him. Besides, beast crystals can't be taken out of the system once he puts them in, and he needs some trade in shops. He only left five behind, so he doesn't need to hand them up, and he didn't expect to be able to evade taxes like this. He now has ten beginner beast crystals, two intermediate, and one ultra beast crystal. He thought the system wouldn't work on weapons that have already been forged, but he didn't expect it to just absorb the ultra beast crystal like that, and he thinks he should be more careful now. If Delbert finds out, he will definitely not let him hear the end of it. Suddenly, he feels something off about Grey and asks him if he left something behind in the forest. Grey doesn't respond, so he reaches him, but he hears him saying he has to open the red door. He asks him about the red door and what it is, but he starts crying loudly. He asks him to calm down, while the others are surprised at where they went because they were right behind them a minute ago. Monk asks them to head back first and he will find them, but Naslavia tries to stop him, saying they will find them together. But he disappears saying he will be back soon, and reaches them and asks what happened to them, and the rest are already far ahead. Lei tells him about Grey that he is not doing well, and he has been talking about a red door. Grey tells them that a voice is calling him and asking him to go to the red door, and Monk seems to know about some place like that. The red door represents the Avrian prison's gate. The same night, Lei finds himself in front of the red door and hears a voice telling him that he has been waiting for him. Lei asks him about who he is, but the person says he will tell him about the secrets of this world. Suddenly, the door opened, and an immense amount of light came out of it. He tries to stop the person and ask about his identity, but he wakes up in his room and finds out that he had a dream. Grey is again talking about the red door, and he wonders if he saw the same room in his dream. Earlier, they asked him about his dream, but he didn't remember anything and revealed that he only passed by that place and glanced at that door. Since then, he started having nightmares every night, but whenever he woke up, he wouldn't remember what he dreamt about. He can only feel endless fear, and something is calling for him from beyond those doors, and that feeling is only getting stronger. He feels like he should take a look, but Monk says that place is absolutely off-limits, and he will get expelled if he goes in there. But Grey is worried and says there is no other way, and if this goes on, he will get tortured to death by the voice inside his head. Lei says it's fine as long as they don't find out, but Monk says it's not just a matter of getting expelled, and he might even die in there. Lei tries to persuade him, saying there is a chance the skills they learned work under the cover of night, and asks Monk if he will join them. Grey asks him not to give him a hard time, and he is already thankful enough that he is willing to come with him. Lei says Monk is better at stealth than either of them so he would be of great help, but Grey says he would still feel bad dragging him into this. Monk shouts at them, says he will join them, and says he will repay Lei for what he did for him during the duel. At present, he thinks the red gates of the Avrian prison should be the source of Grey's nightmares, but now even he dreamt of them. He wonders if the secrets of this world are really hidden in the Academy's prison. Late night the next day at the Avrian prison, the guards are protecting the gate when they reach there. Monk asks Grey if he is sure that they won't get caught because those guards look really strong and if they are black-armed knights, then they will definitely fail. Grey replies that he has been observing this place though, and he found out that they would exchange shifts with regular white-belted knights every Tuesday around 10 to 11 at night. Monk says it looks like he has had this planned for a long time, and speaking of which, he asks him why they exchange shifts at this time every week, and he replies they don't care because they can do whatever they want. Lei activates his dragon ice skill and checks inside the prison, but it's pitch black, and he can't see what's down there with his dragon's eye. He thinks there must be something off, and the fact that this prison is built underground is upsetting to him. After some time, the knights exchange their shifts, and the time has come when they have been waiting for so long. The knights leave, saying the elders are waiting for them, and Grey asks others to follow the plan. Suddenly, someone grabs Grey's hand from behind and asks what they are doing. She is a third-year black belt student Molly, and they ask her what she is doing there. She says that she was training nearby, and she saw them sneaking around, she asks them if they are planning to run away from there. 
Suddenly, two knights appear there, and they see a lot of drums scattered around and decide to settle them. Lei tells Grey that Monk has played his part in the plan, and now he needs to hurry up, but Molly has grabbed him and asks why they are doing this. She warns them saying they are going against the school rules and it's too dangerous in there too. Lei apologizes to her, saying she has seen them, and she asks if they are going to kill her, Grey attacks her from behind and makes her unconscious. He asks Lei if they should leave her there, but he says they are done if she spills their plan, so they must take her with them. Monk is trying to open the door while the guards are almost there. In the meantime, he unlocks the door, and they sneak out behind the knights when they are just talking to each other. Meanwhile, a knight is watching them from a distance and thinks Lei has sent himself to death, and the elder Gibby will be happy after knowing this. They are finally in, but there aren't any windows around there at all, while Grey brings a glowstone. Monk is shocked to see Molly there, and Grey tells him that she found them, so they brought her with them. Suddenly, she wakes up, and Monk asks her about her health, but she shouts at them and asks how they will do this to their senior. Grey asks her to explain themselves and says they have no choice. Lei asks her to go and report this to the elders, but they are already in there, and if she reports them to the elders, then they can get expelled together. Grey tries to calm her down and says they are already inside the prison, so they will go and take a look, but she is still angry at Lei. She then says that she won't take responsibility if they get into trouble, and Grey says they will take care of the matter. They are going downstairs, and Monk says there doesn't seem to be anyone there. Grey says this place has always been forbidden, and he has never heard of criminals being transferred there, so he was wondering why it had always been under guard. Molly exclaims that they have come there because they heard of the rumors. She tells them that this is the Avrian prison, but they say that they don't keep criminals in there. Some people say that the academy is using it as an excuse to hide the things they really want to hide, and once those things appear, it would cause a great uproar. Lei asks her if she knows what they are hiding there, but she replies that they are just rumors. Other than the three knights and the six elders, she doesn't think anyone has been there before. They go down and find out that the wind down there is so strong and Lei hears something from there. Monk asks them to go back because they have made it all the way there, but Grey says he has to go down there and he has to know what has been appearing in his dreams. After some time they reach the bottom of the building, but they are surprised to see another door there. The door is so big that they wonder what material it is made up of and Molly says it seems pretty old. Grey uses his kai to open the door but it is so strong that Monk asks him to stop, saying it seems dangerous. Lei uses his dragon eye to see inside, but he still can't see what is inside there, so there is definitely some sort of high-tier magic spell of some sort of special seal. They try their best, but the door doesn't open, and it seems to be locked, Monk asks them to go back because there is something leagues stronger than them behind that door. But Grey refuses to go back and asks Lei to come and help him, and a status window appears in front of him and asks if he wants to open the door. He says yes, and the door suddenly opens. They ask him what he did, and he replies that he just touched it. Lei thinks the sound of gear went even deeper within, but the magic crystal could only shed light on a small area ahead. They enter the door, and an unknown fear settles down within the hearts of the youngsters present. Suddenly, they hear a high voice, and everyone gets scared. Grey says he just stepped on something and is shocked to see a large number of skeletons there. They seem like some sort of beasts and they think they may get taken out by the knights. Lay says it looks like they are reaching the end and Molly asks them to leave this place. Grey calls them and asks them to look at a larger space underneath and these look like prison cells. There are so many of them that almost looks like an ant colony but nothing is inside. Monk is more worried that they have already escaped and seen everything down there. Molly also asks them to leave because if monsters really were kept there, they would be really strong, and if it already escaped, then they would be in so much danger. Lei also asks Grey to go back because if they return now, they can return before the night's chain shifts again. But he refuses, saying if they go ahead just a little more, they will find the truth, and he can hear someone calling him inside. Lei runs behind him and asks him not to go further, but he enters one of the cells. The wind again gets stronger, and Monk asks Lei about what is happening there, but they are shocked to see Grey falling to the ground. Lei feels someone's very strong presence and sees a beast behind the cell. Molly gets scared to see it and reveals that he is the monarch rank magical beast, the Minotaurus. The beast road releases a large amount of mana and makes them fall to a distance. 
He turns toward Molly and they ask her to move, but she twisted her ankle and is unable to move now. The monster grabs her in his hand and Monk attacks his hand from behind and asks him to let go of her. The beast gets injured and Monk rushes toward Molly, but she can't stand. In the meantime, the beast again rushes toward them and Monk tells her that it's a magical attack and if they don't get up, they will all die there. The beast gathers its energy and is about to attack them, but they are shocked to see another magical beast helping them. Gray has blocked its attack and says he doesn't have time to explain, but they need to know it's on their side. He calls the beast by the name of Noir and asks him to take Molly somewhere safe, and Monk is shocked to see that it can follow orders. He then asks Monk to hide his presence and kill it in a single blow once he holds it down, but he replies it's too risky because he is too strong. Lei releases his Kai, asks him to trust him, and calls the beast to attack him. The beast hits him away and tries to smash his head, but he grabs its horn and thinks it's too strong. The beast tries to free himself, but he is not ready to let it go and instructs Monk to do it now. He appears from another side and stabs the beast with both his hands, but is shocked that it won't penetrate his body, and its skin is as tough as a metal board. Grey asks Monk to dodge his attack and tries to attack him, but his sword shatters in a moment. They fall back to the ground while Lei still grabs his horn and activates the skill of mana siphoning. He gathers a large amount of mana and absorbs it from the beast too. Mana siphoning is successful, and he gathers all the Kai and activates the full force. His technique worked, and he thinks the old man's training wasn't for nothing. Grey calls him from behind and asks him to watch out, but the beast hits him and makes him fall. His body isn't following through properly, and other than the numbing effect from that attack, he absorbed too much mana at once, so his body can't acclimate immediately. His body is still too weak, while the beast stands there and is ready to attack him again. He thinks he doesn't think of a way to solve this, but Sir Kay appears from nowhere and says they have pissed off something really big there. He asks them to leave the way while Monk is happy to see him and says they are saved now. He says there is no need to butter them up, and he will deal with them later. He jumps upon the beast to attack him. He tries to swing his sword to attack him, but the beast grabs his hand and makes him fall to the ground. But he reacts in time and stabs his sword in his hand to get him free. The beast again rushes toward him to attack, but he disappears from sight. He then calls him from his shoulders and asks if he is looking for him, and Grey and Monk are impressed by his strength. Lei asks Noir to go back, and a new ability, Absorb Elements, is unlocked in front of him because he absorbed that lightning attack. Sir Kay comes to them and says that the monarch beast doesn't have much mana left. Otherwise, he would have had a hard time getting off unscathed. He asks them to follow him and also demands an explanation from them. Monk asks him if he will expel them from the academy, and he replies that they should be thankful that they still have the chance to be expelled. To think they would come in there like this, it's a miracle that they are alive. He turns around and says it would be a shame if they just expelled students who could fight a monarch beast and live to tell the tale. He asks them to keep this promise and he won't tell anyone about this. After that, he asks them how they opened the gate and Lei replies that it was open when they arrived. Sir Kay is surprised that the gate is open, and he again hears a voice calling him. He thinks this is the same voice he heard before in his dreams. The voice asks him to come back when he is strong enough. The same night, in the academy hospital, Sir Kay goes to the infirmary and the physician asks him how he got hurt from training and he replies that it was an accident. The other three are also injured and get first aid from there and Lei asks Grey why he went further into the cave when they tried to stop him. Grey replies he just felt an intense need to go deeper and he couldn't control his body or his thoughts. Monk gets up and says he knows the reason for that and he just found out in a book that other than the ability to control the element of lightning, the Minotaurus also has an ability called the Labyrinth of the Heart. According to legend, this monster was born to be a queen and a white bull meant as a sacrifice. The king was furious after he found out about this and ordered a giant maze to be built at the ends of the earth and put under heavy supervision. The bull-headed monster was then held in the maze, never to be released even after death. However, this monster was gifted with the strength of gods, and as it grew, its obsession with escaping the maze started to develop into an ability that would bewitch the hearts of those around it. Influenced people start losing control of their thoughts and becoming controlled by strong emotions. 
Lei thinks it was just a ridiculous legend that a bull and a human had a child, and Gray says it makes it sound like a sad creature and asks Monk what happened to it at the end. He replies that it isn't said in the books, but it probably escaped, and they wouldn't have seen it in prison otherwise. Gray says it must have ended up producing offspring, which explains his nightmares. Lei wonders if that monster caused Gray's nightmares. Then what about the voice he hears at the end? Meanwhile, Sir Kay enters the room, says there is not much wrong with them, and asks them to stay there and rest up for the next few days. Lei asks him about his health, and he replies there is nothing wrong with him, and he has just a couple of broken ribs, and it's just par for the course for people like him. Lei says he just got a monarch-ranked beast crystal and asks if they can get a share of it. Sir Kay shouts at him and asks them not to think about it because these are his labor fees. He then leaves, asking them to rest up and saying they will do a more thorough checkup on them tomorrow morning. Lei says he has another question. He asks him how he knew about them that they were there, and Gray also says they should be the only ones who knew, even though Molly wanted to report them, but she didn't have the time. Sir Kay replies they want to know many secrets and says the lurkers told him about that. Lei finds out that they have been kept under watch this whole time, and Monk also heard before that some people in this academy hide between the students and the common folk, protecting students from harm. Sir Kay says he will not tell them about the lurker, and Lei thinks the more he knows, the more he realizes that this academy isn't as simple as it first looked. He now thinks the explorability has and finds out that it can absorb the target's magic and enhance spells of the same element. He thinks the ability is not really useful for him and wonders if he should find the time to study magic. He asked others to keep Noir a secret, and judging from how Sir Kay didn't ask him anything, he didn't find out either. It doesn't seem like Grey has any more of those dreams, and he wonders if it was really because of that monster. The next morning, he goes to the martial arts club and trains very hard. The old man appreciates him and says this way of attacking suits him well. He tells him that his sword becomes more of a defensive measure in this state, and attacking with his fists isn't strong enough. The old man suddenly remembers something and says he should give him something. After a while, the old man is looking for something and says he will surely put it there, and Lei asks him not to give it if he can't find it. In the meantime, he finds the desired thing called dragon turtle gauntlets. They are so heavy, and Lei asks him if they are really that good. He asks him to wait because they change their sizes according to the wearer. In the meantime, they change the size according to his hands, and Lei asks him if these are made from beast crystals, and he replies that they were only made from an intermediate dragon turtle's beast crystal. If it were an advanced beast crystal, it would be much stronger, and the old man says he wants to give him higher grade pieces of equipment, but it would be far too unfair for other contestants. Lei asks him about the contestants, and he asks him if he hasn't been in class. He reveals that every student in the second year and above has to join the annual academy tournament, and by having the students fight one-on-one, -on -one, they will find the five strongest contestants in the academy. These five will go on to become representatives of the academy in the World Combat Tournament, fighting against strong foes from all around the world. The old man says these gauntlets are for him, and asks him to get at least tenth place for him, while Lei says he has high expectations from him. He says he now has weapons now, so asks him to get something defensive, and breastplates or shields are always pretty useful on the mission. He then goes to a weapon store, but is shocked to hear the prices of weapons, and the shopkeeper leaves, saying he should go somewhere else because the price is fixed. He exclaims that his prices have always been reasonable, and forging defensive gear from an intermediate beast crystal requires a payment of 10 beginner beast crystals or a thousand bucks. He whispers and says he is not interested in where he got these crystals from, and Lei thinks if this academy has its eyes on him because of this, he won't be able to hunt alone anymore. He gives him the crystals and Lei thinks humans really are sly, no matter what they work as. Suddenly, Naslavia calls him from behind, and he asks her if she has come there for pieces of equipment too. He asks her to go somewhere else because this shopkeeper is very greedy. She calls the owner, and he happily greets her saying she is the young lady from the Hart family. Naslavia replies she has come there to commission a request and asks on behalf of her friend the price of a defensive piece of equipment crafted from intermediate beast crystals. Lei wonders if she is from a famous family because he just called her young lady, and soon she gets the extra beast crystals he took from him earlier. Lei thinks humans get treated so differently, even though they are the same, and the children of knights become knights, and the children of farmers stay farmers. 
He thanks Nislavia for their help and gives her an intermediate beast crystal as a thanksgiving gift. She refuses to take it because it's much more expensive than 10 beginner beast crystals. Lei asks her to take it because it's not much use to him now that he has a weapon and defensive gear and leaves her, saying goodbye. After a few days, he receives his defensive gear and the shopkeeper apologizes, saying he didn't know he was a friend of the young lady of the Hart family before. Lei has seen the result in his Kai practice, and with this armor and the gauntlets the old man gave him, he can't wait to hunt even higher ranked monsters. At the same time, the elder Gigi is informed about his encounter in the prison, and he is also surprised that he escaped from the prison alive. The assassin reports to him that a lurker told Sir Kay about it, and he is the one who saved them. He exclaims he never expects the archaic system to be of some use. The assassin says they have the three knights with them, and along with that troublesome K, it would be difficult to strike. He asks him to test Delbert out, and the head says they should not rush because he is a suitable candidate, but he is one of the three knights, so he still has to test his loyalty. He then orders him to try another one and asks him to tell him if he succeeds, the Pureblood Guild will give him a new position. He also says if he fails, the assassin makes sure he doesn't come back and report to him. On the other side, the students reach the mountain forest hunting grounds and are determined to earn more crystals to get equipment. Monk and Ian thank Lei for his help and say when they have the ability to, they will pay him back with something better. Lei doesn't understand why they are all thanking him, and he talks to Nislavia and says they may want to thank her. She asks him to remember the beast crustal he gave him, so she exchanged it for gold and gave them to their teammates under his name. Lei doesn't reply to her, and she asks him if he is angry about this, which she should have discussed with him earlier, he says he is not angry and thinks she can become a good leader. She gets angry and asks him why he got all serious all of a sudden. After some time, Gray asks him if something happened between him and Neslavia, and he asks him what he is talking about. Gray asks him to forget this, says he is about as slow as a piece of wood, and asks him to promise that he won't treat Amy like this. In the meantime, Monk and Dan ask everyone to be careful and be ready for the battle. Lei uses his dragon ice skill and discovers that these are all just beginner rank monsters, which is too easy for everyone, and there is no more challenge around there. Monk is fighting bravely and cuts out many bugs in just one slash. Suddenly, Lei shouts from his place and asks him to watch out because a Hercules beetle is approaching him. Monk jumps from his place to dodge it, but gets scared to see an intermediate rank monster. Dan comes to his help and says it's just a bug at the end of the day. He attacks the bug with his full might and makes him fall, but the thing's defenses are pretty tough, and Lei asks him to be careful because there are more incoming. There are many intermediate bugs, and they all have surround them from all sides. Gray tries to attack him, but it's too hard, and he can't penetrate his sword in its body. Martha also can't shoot through their shells with her arrows. They get scared because their attacks are not working on the bugs. Suddenly, they hear destruction from a distance, and it is Lei using his gauntlets and killing them individually. He jumps toward them and destroys them all using his gauntlets. They are shocked to see his strength, and Dan asks them what new weapon he has recently, which is crazy strong. Monk replies that the advisor of the martial arts club lent it to him, and Dan feels like he joined the wrong club. Lei thinks he can't make it look too easy or else they will get suspicious and he shouts at them to come to help him out and not just stand there. In the meantime, Martha and Naslavia also come for his help and attack the monsters from all sides. Monk's attack also works this time, successfully penetrating his sword in one of the bugs. Dan and Ian also fight them bravely and piercing through their bodies individually. After some time, they have defeated the last one, and Dan laughs and says they are rich now because these are all intermediate rank monsters, so there are definitely intermediate beast crystals. Lei also obtains some beast crystals and a status window appears there asking if he wants to absorb them. Suddenly, he sees many birds fly at once and uses Dragon's Eye to see through. He shouts and invites everyone to be careful because of a forest fire. Martha also sees flames from a distance, chaotic trampling noises everywhere, and the beasts are fleeing. Dan asks them what they are waiting for and tells them they should run away, but Lei doesn't think they can make it because the fire surrounds them. Martha asks Naslavia if she has the rescue crystals and asks her to send the signal because they can only count on them to save them now. She replied that she tried sending one earlier, but it didn't work. 
Suddenly, Lei feels someone's presence there and asks them who they are, but three weird men stare at them. Monk asks if they are there to save them, but Lei has a strange feeling about them. Gray asks them if they set the fire and what they want, but one of them raises his hand and calls a beast to attack them. Monk falls to the ground while Gray tries to dodge him. In the meantime, one of the beasts rushes toward Lei, and he tries to dodge him with his sword. He asks them about who the hell they are and why they are attacking them. He observes that his sword isn't a regular weapon and pushes him away. Ian asks Monk if he is okay, and he asks him to go and help Lei and Gray. Ian comes to help them, but there is a huge wave of fire there, which separates him from them. Lei thinks they have separated them deliberately and wonders if they are there for him and Gray. Gray is already occupied, so he must fight them both at once. He asks Ian to leave them there and get help for others, and standing there is no use. He asks them to go and get help from the knights, and Naslavia runs and says Lei is right that they should get help from him. He asks Lei if he can keep up, and he asks him to leave that guy to him. They are fast, but not enough to overwhelm him completely, and as long as he defends well enough, it won't be fatal. Meanwhile, Gray thinks he will keep him occupied and buy time for Lei while he is fighting with the other two. They rush to attack him, but he already knows their pattern and dodges him. In the meantime, the other one rushes from behind and tries to attack him, but he uses his genelets to dodge their attack. However, they are using fire in their attacks, which is getting troublesome for him. Whenever he focuses on one, the other jumps in to disturb him, and one hits him with his chain cylinder and makes him fall to the ground. They are working together better than he expected, and thankfully, his arm out blocked the worst of it. He needs to reconsider his battle plan and sees Gray getting injured because he just healed his arm. The assassin rushes toward him, saying he won't have to worry about that anymore, and Gray asks Lei not to worry because he will deal with this one. The assassin comes toward him, and Lei says if they are planning on killing them, then he has no reason to hold back. He uses his five beginner beast crystals and releases a large amount of energy. The assassins are shocked at his power level, and Lei is notified that he has evolved into a dragon knight. He brings Noir out and says it's time to hunt those assassins. One of them asks others if they never said the kid knows the magic, but he says it doesn't matter, and they will continue with the mission. They rush toward Lei together, and he thinks he won't fail at this move again. He asks Noir to go and attack them, and the assassin is surprised by his strength. He sits on Noir and asks him to run, and they run through the assassins so speedily that they are unable to catch his movements. The assassin says the kid is thinking he can trap them, and Noir asks Noir if he will leave the guy with a sickle to him. He separates from Noir and rushes toward each other. He is fighting with one when the second one appears from behind, but Noir appears to attack him. The assassin dodges his attack, saying he kills beasts like him for breakfast, while Lei thinks the assassin's sword is troublesome and he needs to restrain it. He thinks this is strange that he is actively avoiding close combat once the chain guy is not with him. He thinks of a plan, decides to try it, and reaches the assassin by closing their distance. The assassin is shocked, and Lei attacks him, thinking he already knows he doesn't want to engage. He now knows his weakness, but is surprised to see Gray's condition. The assassin is annoyed at him and says how a mere student is so hard to deal with, and Gray replies that they are students of Avrian. He asks the assassin why they attacked them, but the other one rushes and pushes him into the fire and dies in front of them. Gray is shocked to see that they are willing to kill their allies, and he thinks he should now go and help Lei. But he is so tired that he falls to the ground, and Lei asks him not to worry about him and to rest. He says he will kill this man in pieces. He takes the sword in his mouth and says scum like him don't deserve to be part of this world. He jumps upon him and says they would even throw the lives of their comrades and are attacking him again and again. He gets tired and thinks he has sturdy armor and they are equipped with special equipment, not just their weapons. It looks like they are well prepared and if this goes on, then his equipment's not going to hold and he needs to find an opportunity. At the same time, the other one is fighting with Noir and he thinks that he would be strong, but he is just an intermediate rank and says he will die before his master does. Noir tries to trick and cause confusion for him, and the assassin asks him not to look down on him. Gray is watching all this and thinks he must do something while the assassin catches him in the chains. He takes up his sword to kill Noir when Gray interrupts him and blocks his attack. He asks the assassin to stop right there and asks if he still has some power left in him. 
He pushes him away, saying he will kill him if he wants to die for a monster. His sword falls to the ground at a distance, but he grabs his leg and asks Noir to pick up the sword and fight like his master. Noir picks the sword in his mouth, and Grey says he won't let him go even if he dies there. In the meantime, Noir attacks him and beheaded him with just one slash of the sword. The assassin is shocked to see his companion's condition and thinks they are all useless. Lei takes advantage of this situation and throws his sword toward him, reaches him close their distance, and asks him to dodge him this time. His mask is removed, and they are shocked to see Knight Lancey behind it. He takes off his mask, and Grey asks him why he is doing this when he is his teacher, but he replies it doesn't matter and rushes toward Grey to kill him. Lei shouts at him and asks him to watch out, but Noir jumps upon them and pushes Grey away. Lei asks Noir to return and undo his summoning, and Grey is also saved now. In the meantime, Lancey jumps toward him and says his struggle is useless because he will kill them one after the other. Lei thinks trash like he always exists among humans, and no matter what their objectives are, they have to be involved to get others. He jumps up on him, saying his time is up, but he dodges his attack, asking if he likes targeting him. He activates his skill of absorbing elements, and Lancey laughs at him saying he is just using all his energy to grab this sword. But Lei laughs and says he is the one who is going to die, while many status windows appear there saying that he has received free elements. Lancey is shocked to see the flames are becoming weaker, and he asks him to die. Lei gets really tired, and because his energy has drained, he pushes Lancey away and is shocked at his power level. Lei thinks a few of his ribs are broken, and he can use the fire element he absorbed, which is the only magic he can use now. If he can combine Kai with the fire element, it will become a unique weapon. Lancey is shocked to see this and says he was a demon after all, and they should have killed him long ago. They both rush toward each other while Lei is ready to face him again and calls him a pitiable human. He passes through him and cuts one of his arms, and Lancey is shocked that his flame sword didn't react. He cries in pain, but Lei grabs his face and says his time is up now. Lancey cries in pain, but he doesn't have mercy upon him and burns him away. He then exclaimed he got what he deserved. He turns behind and sees Sir Kay rushes toward them and asks if they are all right, but he falls to the ground and gets unconscious. The students say they were from the Pureblood Guild and need to notify Winford about that. Sir Kay asks them to take him to the hospital because his face and arms are badly wounded. When he wakes up, he feels the familiar ceiling and the familiar smell, which means he is again at the hospital. He feels so much weight on his arm and also feels Naslavia beside him. She gets happy to see him awake, and he asks her how long he has been asleep. She replies that he was unconscious for about three days and is recovering very well. He remembers feeling his mouth burn, but now it's completely fine, and Naslavia says she will tell others because they have been waiting for him to wake up. After some time, Sir Kay enters the room, and he uses some magic to ensure that no one can listen to what they are going to say. Lei asks him what he is doing and why all the red hairs are there. He starts the conversation and says two of their students were attacked this time and were even close to being killed. After discussing with Winford, he decides to tell them about this, but before that, he asks Lei if he knows who attacked them. Lei replies that there were three masked assailants, and he couldn't tell who two were, but one was the Night Master Lancey. Everyone is shocked at how this can be possible, and Kyle says he already knew that guy was up to no good. Naslavia asks him if they are part of the Dark Guild, she has read about them in books before, and she heard that they are a radical organization. Sir Kay replies that they are from the Pure Blood Guild, and in contrast to the Dark Guild, the Pure Blood Guild has many supporters within their academy. They have even gotten the backing of one of the elders, and Naslavia asks him how an elder can allow something like this. Sir Kay says it's not as cut and dry as they might think, and Lei asks him about their goal. Sir Kay replies he is sure that he already has the guesses, and other than the victims of this incident, he has called the other red-haired kids there. Lei states that they want to get rid of them, and one of them says he can throw away his wooden sword and use a real weapon. Kyle gets up and says this doesn't make sense and asks him if this prophecy says this one of them is the savior of this world, and he replies that there is also a second part of the prophecy. He reveals that the second part of the prophecy is that the red-haired child could either become the world's savior or cause its destruction. He states that there have always been knights who value birthright and bloodlines above all, 
and they couldn't accept that what they had been safeguarding for generations would be taken by kids from who knows where. Sadly enough, there are quite a lot of people who follow this train of thought. On the other hand, war has been happening on the borders of Allure, and they both need to defend against the shadows and other countries and maintain the academy. Under these circumstances, the higher-ups can't afford to flip the table with the pure blood guild, so to speak. Peace will no longer be maintained if the Allure kingdom breaks from within. Kyle asks him what they should do, or if they should just let them attack them. Dan exclaims this doesn't have to do with them, and that they are not the ones who will save the world. Naslavia shouts at him and asks how he can say this when they are all their friends, and Sir Kay says it doesn't matter if they like it or not, but they all have caught up in the mess. From what happened this time, they are becoming more and more daring and must be on constant alert. He has arranged for some lurkers to be by their side, and Winford, and he are going to keep tabs on them. However, he has to say that there are far too few people they can trust completely, and since they have their duties too, they won't be able to keep an eye on them all the time. Therefore, they have to rely on themselves. Monk says there's no way other than to work hard and become stronger. Sir Kay laughs and displays according to his experience, most people who rely on others to protect them are the first ones to die. He then asks everyone to leave and says he has to talk with Lei. One week later, he gets out of the infirmary and is finally happy to leave this place, he would have gone mad if they didn't let him out. The gauntlets the old man gave him are pretty battered, so he needs to fix them. Noir isn't fatally wounded, but it needs time to rest and recover, and he used up quite a few intermediate beast crystals to help it heal, so he needs to hunt too. He thinks Sir Kay said all that, and now he can't even relax. One week ago, Sir Kay told him that he is the most likely to become the one the prophecy is talking about and has the most different qualities out of everyone. His body has been able to recover rapidly after being on the brink of death many times and he is trying to hide it the most he can, but he knows that he can use the magic. He wonders how to explain this to him and if he should tell him that he was a dragon in his past life. Moreover, as a kid, he had black hair and could recover quickly because of the dragon's ability. Sir Kay told him that he seemed to be their main target from what the Pure Blood Guild did earlier, so he should be more careful than the others from now on. He thinks Lancey was a tough nut to crack by himself, and now they will probably going to send someone stronger. He can't be a sitting duck now. Elder Gibby watches him from a distance and says he never expects Lancey to be that useless. He couldn't even deal with a student with all the high-grade equipment they gave him. However, he is relieved at Lancey so he didn't have a chance to say anything he shouldn't have. The assassin told him that Kay and Winford had already realized their objective and Lay was under heavy watch now, so they might now be able to do anything to him for a while. The elder again wears his mask and asks him to bring Delbert to him because they have ignored him for a while. If he wants to show them his loyalty, they will have him pluck a few nails for them. On the other side, Lay goes to his dormitory and everyone there welcomes him, and they ask him why he is hurt again. He replies that he went and fought the old man at the martial arts club, and this happened there. In the meantime, Naslavia enters the room and informs Gray about a letter. She is happy to see Lay there and asks about his health, and he replies that he is more or less recovered now. Martha suggests grooming his hair a little, and Dan says he should shave off half of his head just like him. Kyle asks him to go bald like him, and Lay asks him what he is doing there and Ian replies that they had a space and Kyle has always wanted to come there, so he shifts in their room. Lay asks Gray if he doesn't object to this because Kyle is too noisy, but he is surprised to see him lost in the letter. Suddenly, he gets up and runs away from the room, and everyone is shocked at what just happened to him. Lay runs behind him and uses his dragon's eye to see where Gray is. He finds him on the roof and reaches him in no time. He asks him about what happened to him because everyone is worried about him. Gray told him that he just received a letter in which it said that his sister Amy had died. Lay remembers when he first met her when they were just five years old, and she asked him not to mind how other people see her. He never had the chance to thank her and always thought he would have the chance to say it to her directly. But she is now dead, and her parents are crying beside her coffin. Lay is shocked at her death, and Gray says he remembers the nightmare that he has never been able to shake from his mind. He dreamt that Amy was ripped to shred by monsters at the Roland Academy at the feet of gods. Under the gazes of countless aristocrats, she was dying helplessly, and no one helped her. Only now did he realize that it wasn't a dream but a premonition. 
His parents said that the nobles at the academy gave their family a great amount of money as compensation, but she has died. He gets up angrily and says in their eyes that the one who died was just an insignificant child from the countryside, and to them, giving money is enough. Those nobles are going to eat foie gras tomorrow and talk about their goals and aspirations, and his sister and her death won't even be worthy of becoming an after-meal topic. He is determined that he won't forgive them and will find the person who killed his sister and will kill him. Lei comes forward and asks him to count him in his revenge. Gray says he has awakened the magic power and can also summon a beast and use flames. He asks him to show his powers to elders so that they can transfer him there and then he will be able to kill him. Lei says his abilities are abnormal and if he tells the elders they will only keep a closer eye on him. Moreover, he can't leave him alone, and they must find a way to leave Avrian together. Gray asks him how they will do this because from now until they graduate, and then after the two years, they have to volunteer for the academy. By that time, the killer will have probably gone somewhere else. Lei tells him that the academy tournament is coming up soon, and if they can get first place, they will be able to represent their academy in the World Combat Tournament. When that happens, they will be able to meet people from Roland, and Gray understands what he is trying to say. On the other side, in the third year's dorms, Harry asks his roommates about others, and they reply that they are all preparing for the academy tournament. Harry asks about the student's report, and he replies that he thought Jira could put up a good fight, but he is on a mission. He hopes there are interesting newbies among the second years who can put in a good effort. On the other hand, Kyle and Monk observe that Gray has been going so hard lately, and they ask Lei if something happened to him. Lei asks them to just give him some space from now. He is practicing and thinks this isn't nearly enough, and he is still too weak. Meanwhile, Sir Kay approaches him and asks him to follow him since he has something good for him. He shows them the equipment Lancy and the other two knights used, says he has gotten them to fix up all, and asks them to pick one each. Gray and Monk pick weapons of their choice and Kyle asks him if they can also like weapons while they can't help when attacked. Sir Kay replies the tournament is a good chance and all students other than the first years can join. According to tradition, many affluent families will come to watch the game, and they will likely notice them if they do well in the tournament. Once they leave the academy, they can become one of their guards, which would be a nice deal. Gray thinks he can become the guard of a noble family if he does well. Lay asks Sir Kay about Lancy's sword, and he replies that it wasn't damaged that much, but it lost the ability to channel flame magic, so it's no different from a beginner's weapon. Sir Kay suggests to pick him something else, and Lay thinks he absorbed all the fire elements from this. From the look of it, absorbed elements are more useful than he thought. The same night, he goes to the forest to search for something. He is looking for ice elemental beasts, and many golems exist. He thinks it was well worth the effort and takes out Noir and says he will be leaving the ones of the left to him. Three weeks later, on the day of the Avrian Knight Academy tournament, attracting academics from far and wide, the students gathered in the waiting hall. Molly asks Harry if he is going to hide his abilities this time, while his elder brother tells Sebastian that he has already arranged everything for him. Martha rushes toward Lei and Nislavia, saying that the rules for the tournament have changed this year. She is about to tell them when there is an announcement that knights have arrived and theory will start the tournament. One of them announces and asks the top five students from both the second year and third year to come out, and Monk wonders what they are planning this time. Dan steps in, thinking if Lei hadn't given up his position, then he wouldn't have been able to slip in there. The knight then calls the third year students, and one of them tells her that Jira is out on a mission. She then asks about Jay Gree, who is on the other side with his large sword. He exclaims that he will sit there and wait for them to challenge him. Lei finds out that he is the first ranking in the academy, and the students discuss that they only hear stories about him, but they don't expect that he will join the tournament. Mark wonders if they will tell them to fight the third year, so the head knight asks them to face each other. She states that the ten students mentioned just now don't have to join the first round of preliminaries. Kyle says he was worried that they would fight with the third years, but they abandoned them and advanced first, and Lay says he can only blame himself for not being top five. The head knight announces that the first round is going to be a battle royale, where the second and third years compete against each other, and five people move on to TH next round from each match. She calls Ian, says he looks pretty well built, and asks him to come out. 
She tells them that each student can only use wooden weapons supplied in the arena, and each one will be given a hundred health points. She attacks him with a bow and shows them that if they get attacked, their health points go down. If they add Kai into their attack, they will deal more damage, if they use Kai when defending, they will take less damage. Once that bar hits zero, they will be immediately disqualified and teleported out of the arena. She asks the second-year students to prepare themselves, put their weapons in the storage rooms provided, and pick a suitable weapon. Sebastian calls a third-year student and asks him not to let Lei have a chance later on the stage, and he picks up a sword, saying it suits him better. Kyle picks up chains because they are made of metals, and an announcement welcomes students to the Avrian Academy tournament. Now, they will be having their first competition and welcome their participants. They can see all the health points on the display, and when their health point hits zero, they will be disqualified until only five are left. Kyle and Martha are scared to see so many people, and she is starting to feel the jitters. The head elder announces and asks everyone to sit and watch the show while all the elders and knights reach there. The old man also sees Lei there and thinks this is the time for him to show his mettle. The first match begins and many third-year students rush toward Lei to attack. He observes that they are working together against him. Sebastian also appears from the side to attack him, and Eric asks everyone to get him disqualified first. Sebastian says he will make him pay back everything he owes him. Lei dodges his attack and hits his sword, causing him to throw it on the ground. In the meantime, three seniors jump toward him together, but he uses Sebastian as his shield, and they all hit him. He shouts at them and asks them what they are doing. They haven't seen their boss, but Lei grabs him by his neck and calls him a monster. He hits him to the ground, saying he should be thankful that he would only get disqualified. He falls to the ground at a distance, and his health level goes to zero. He is so embarrassed because he is the first disqualified participant. Delbert angrily hits the table, and the elder Gibby is observing his movements. Lei then asks others about what they are waiting for and asks them to come to him together. Eric shouts at them and asks them to stop being so smug and get him all together. He first jumps toward Eric and is about to hit him with his sword when he shouts at him and asks him to get away from him. Lei grabs his arm and turns it around his body, and he slips his sword from his other hand. Gree is surprised and says the red-haired kid's power is something else, and the other student calls him a cruel participant. She exclaims that the competition was held to test and observe the techniques of the students, but it ended up giving him a chance to be ruthless. Every time he attacks, it only reduces about 20 health points of the enemy, and if this goes on, someone might lose their life out there. Naslavia and Ian are also shocked to see the movement that he is treating them badly, while Gray says he is serving them right. He asks if they really think that they can win by ganging up on him while he is beating them gradually. Dan wonders if they don't know how to use Kai, and Naslavia replies they are using Kai, but he is just far too strong. The audience is also not happy with his attitude and says they shouldn't have allowed someone like him to participate in the first place. He hears their conversation and stares at them, and they wonder how he can hear them when they are so far away from him. One of the elders asks if they should stop the boy, but the old man replies they shouldn't stop him because no one stopped them when they started ganging up on him. One of the elders asks what they will do if he kills one of them, and the old man replies he is just making a smart choice that ensures that he won't get ganged up on again. He also states Lei is his student and that he will take responsibility if anything happens, and the other elders just quietly stare at the old man. In the meantime, the third-year audience says it looks like the top five have been confirmed, and he says it is shameful that Harry's brother was the first one to get eliminated. He replies it's a good thing because his father dotes on him too much, while Gree says he can't wait to start fighting. Martha and Kyle have also defeated many students, and the twin brothers are also performing very well. In the meantime, Lei has taken down them all, and they are threatening him while lying to the ground. He turns toward a student, but he starts shouting and asks him to stop right there, but he grabs him from his face. One of the elders stands up and says the boy is going to kill him, while Lei threatens him and asks him not to even think of becoming a knight. He absorbs his mana and makes him fall to the ground badly reducing his health rate to zero. The elder says to the old man that he was right because he didn't continue to hurt the other students, while he is relieved that he stopped breaking their limbs. He grabs another student, but the other student tries to hit him with an arrow, which he dodges successfully and asks him to let go of him. 
Lei leaves the boy and makes him fall to the ground. The girl jumps upon him and tries to attack him again, but he reacts in time and dodges her attack. She attacks him one after the other, but he moves gradually with the arrows and dodges all of them. He then closes the distance and grabs her by the neck. She tries to free herself, but Lei is not ready to leave her. Her father shouts from the audience and asks him to leave his daughter, calling him a monster. Lei remembers his father and wonders if he cares for his daughter and what about his father. He contributed so much to the country and saved many people, but what happened to him? He only wished for his mother to kill him. He gets so angry and is about to kill the girl when Kyle puts his chains on his arm and asks him to stop. He asks him why he is stopping him and he replies that the girl is innocent and he doesn't need to be so harsh. The twin brothers also approach him and say he is crossing a line and those guys have already been punished and he steps back, thinking why he should listen to them. He remembers all the good times he spent with Martha, Naslavia and Kyle. He wonders why it is always like this. He releases a large amount of Kai and says they don't know anything about him and if they want to stop him, they have to defeat him right now. He pulls the chains, throws Kyle to the ground, and then hits him badly, reducing his health points. He then says if he wants to defeat him, then he has to practice how to focus his Kai. Martha tries to attack him with three arrows at a time, but he dodges her attack and catches the arrows. She is shocked to see that he grabbed her arrows his his bare hands. He then uses his Kai to throw them back toward her, and they are so quick that she can't dodge them. He reaches her and hits her to the ground, saying if she wants to defeat him, then she shouldn't hesitate. He asks her to learn to predict his movement instead of staring at where he stands. After that, the twin brother rushes toward him and says he has done enough. But he uses his Kai and falls back, saying they should plan their moves. He jumps behind them, says they are wasting their time, and hits them badly, reducing their health points. The girl from earlier is watching him and thinks he is so strong that she can't even think of fighting him. The people in the audience are also shocked at his power and think he is unmatched, and if even that red-haired kid didn't make it into the top five, then the ones in the top five must really be something else. Ian and the others are also shocked, but they know they are no match compared to Lei, and Monk says it doesn't feel good to be targeted. Lei then turns toward the girl. She is so scared of him and thinks she won't be able to beat him. He gathers his energy and is about to attack her while his father shouts from a distance and asks where the judge is. But Lei just smacks her head and apologizes to her for earlier. They are shocked that the fight ended like this and the top five participants appear on the screen and four are red-haired. They ask everyone to get some rest when they fix the arena, and they will continue the battle royale for the third year later in the afternoon. One of the elders says the red-haired boy performed well, and if he were to go on a rampage someday, not many people would be able to stop him. Winford informs the head elder about the injured students and reveals that they passed due to mana deficiency, and it seems like they won't be able to use Kai in the short term, and they aren't sure if they will be able to recover. The head elder says they will not speak of this any further, and there's enough he needs to worry about. After some time, Gray is training with the wooden puppet in the training room, and the students are wondering to see him and say they are going hard in the afternoon. He fights very hard with the wooden puppet and clears the twelfth level. However, he thinks he still needs to be more than Lei. He remembers when Sir Kay said that many affluent families would come to watch the tournament, and if they did well, they would most probably notice him. Once they leave the academy, they can become one of their guards, and it will be a nice deal for them. He thinks more is needed and he has to get more strong. Meanwhile, the third year students are watching him and they say he is the first place in the second year, while Harry replies the other one suits him better. The student says Gray has a good face and he reminds him of Harry and he can perform better. Harry goes to Gray and activates the twelfth level. The wooden puppet rushes to attack him, but he dodges its attacks and kicks him from behind. Soon, he passes the twelfth level, and Gray observes that he copied all of his movements. He says Harry can tell him if he wants to fight him, and the other students start staring at them, expecting a fight between them. In the meantime, Neslavia appears there and grabs his hand, saying the competition is in the afternoon and is about to start. He takes him to a side, and Gray asks her why she stopped him, and she asks him if he is stupid because his right to participate can cancelled if he fights outside the ring. Gray didn't think about that and now understands the situation, and she asks him to stay calm if he wants to win. They hear the announcement to start the afternoon round, 
and Naslavia asks him about Lei. He has no idea because he disappeared when the round ended just now. They hear Winford's voice from the side and find out that Lei is with Sir Winford. They wonder what they are doing together and Lei tells him that he doesn't want to compete any longer. Winford is also surprised by his decision and asks him if he is serious. He asks him about the reason, but he refuses to say anything. They hear an announcement that the competitors are all prepared for the competition, and they ask them to take their seats, and he leaves saying he has to supervise the competition and they can talk about it later. He says Lei is independent now, and he wants to tell him that no matter what choices he makes, he will respect him. He then sees Nislavia and Grey there, and they say they didn't mean to eavesdrop. He asks them if they heard everything, and Grey replies they heard everything. He leaves them, saying it's nothing major about him. He is about to leave, and Grey calls him from behind and asks if he is going to break his promise. He asks him about Ame and if his sister's death is going to be glossed over just like that. Naslavia is shocked to hear about his sister and thinks this is the reason he has been so depressed lately. Lei replies he can't forget her because she is a human and his first friend, and he also wants to take revenge for her. Naslavia asks him if he feels conflicted, and she knows that he is hurting. His heart is filled with rage towards the people who ganged up against him, and he feels bad for attacking their friends and innocent people. She says none of it is his fault, and she just wants to let him know that no one is upset with him. Kyle is also cool about that matter, and Martha says Lei is so strong that they couldn't even follow his movements. Monk also tries to persuade them, saying he saw through all their weaknesses in a moment. Naslavia tells him that Kyle, Martha, and everyone else look up to him as an example. Gray calls him and says he knows how unfairly he was treated in the past, but he is not alone. He assures him that they are all his family, and he is sure that he won't leave him all by himself either. After some time, they reach the ground where the third year competition had started. Martha and Dan are waiting for them, and Dan is surprised to see Lay there and thinks he will not replace him. Maslavia asks Martha if there is anyone of note in the third year, and she replies that they are all pretty strong and have their own strengths. She shows him Harry and says he is Al Elegant Fighter and the only one who hasn't gotten hurt this entire time. The other big guy is Geo, and he is strong and explosive, and he can compete with the first place in terms of body. Sumire and Mizuiro are adept at using fans, and they work with each other well to attack and defend. She feels like even Sloth and Badger might not have that high of a degree of coordination with one another. She lost the other one in the team, and Lei shows her Molly, who is quite strong. She got into the top five too, and soon they finished the round, and there was an announcement that they congratulated the five winners of the third year bracket. Gray is observing the situation and thinks the main event will start now. Sir Winford announces that after two rounds of competition, they are down to the final 20. He observes Lay's presence there and says the second years have performed much better than expected in the first round. Lay nods and shows his presence in the competition, and Winford says the rules have been implemented for the competition and asks them to look at the screen. He leads the new matchups and the competitors of the third round, and the audience thinks this is unfair to see the second year going against the third year. Gray's opponent is Harry, and he thinks he just wants the same opponent for himself. Naslavia is against the strongest in the entire academy, and she wonders if she can do it, while he wants to match up against Lay. Harry says he will have a chance and says he has grown so much more and he wants to fight him too. He then says he doesn't need to fight him in a competition. At the same time at the foreign stand it seems like they won't be able to see the youngest sister's performance today. One of them exclaims it doesn't really matter and they don't often come to Avrian so they have to get their sister to bring them around. Sir Winforce announces that the finals will be held a day later and the contestants shall not be limited to their weapons and equipment. Dan says it is easy for him to say that they are going to have to compete in equipment with the third years and Ian asks him to treat it like special training. Meanwhile, Monk thinks about Molly that she is his senior in black belt and he is bound to have to defeat her if he wants to improve. Anyway, the strange thing is that Lay's opponent is the one who didn't show up and he thinks it is fine because he will be relaxed more about fighting against someone, not in the second year. The same night, he asks others if they are not going back and Gray replies they are going to do some more training. He thinks this fight is one that Gray can't lose, but his opponent Harry is very strong. He just hopes that Gray wins the competition. A while ago, Sir Winford said he was happy that he had changed his mind, 
and he told him that it was all because some people were nagging him for it. He revealed that the top 10 winners will have the right to represent Avrian in the World Combat Tournament. Lei was surprised and asked if it wasn't only five, and Winford said he could only say that it had to do with the Pure Blood Guild and that the elders would announce this after the competition. He didn't want him to let go of this chance, and he said he understood the situation. He goes to his room and thinks he didn't expect a competition to cause so much trouble, and wonders what the Pure Blood Guild will do next. He finds a piece of paper beside his bed, and someone calls him to meet at the arena at 9 at night. Lei wonders if this is some kind of trap, but he decides to meet him. Sir Kay and Winford told him not to act by himself, but this is the only way he can use his abilities freely. He thinks he knows nothing about the Pure Blood Guild or the Dark Guild, and he needs more information so that he can find clues about his father. He uses his dragon's eye and thinks if this is a trap, then it would be best to catch them alive. Suddenly, the third-year student Gree reaches there and says this is a coincidence, but he finally has the chance to talk with him. He exclaims those people in the morning were really, really an eyesore.